Welcome back, everyone, to the Fast Life Podcast, which is brought to you by Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. As many of you guys know, I am a Simpson motherfucking fan. Uh, personally, have a Ghost and Mod Bandit and looking forward to getting me an Outlaw just so I can uh, have the trifecta of badassness shit. <laughs> And uh, just so you guys know, I've ridden with these helmets coast to coast, and uh, they are legit. If they weren't, I wouldn't wear them. It's that simple. Uh, you can check out all the models and options at SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com, uh, as well as check them out on Simpson Motorcycle Helmets on Instagram. Another good thing that's going to be taking place is uh, Simpson's Mother Store, which is in New Braunfels, Texas, is having their annual open house car and bike show Sunday, October 19th from 10 to 3 p.m. In addition, us here at the Fast Life Garage will be hosting a small camp out at Haco Springs, Waco Springs. I keep fucking that up. Uh, campground, which is not too far away from the actual Simpson uh, headquarters, Friday the 18th through Sunday the 20th. All you guys are welcome. We're going to be having a good time doing some riding in the hill country, drinking some beer, and uh, just having a good time. So come do it with us. All are welcome. Even you, Steve Chamberlain. Come on, buddy. Have you guys heard Lex and Moto drop some new products at this year's AIM Expo? Like the FT4 Pro to be the first in the industry to have a patented utility light with SOS function. The GT8 will be the absolute cutting edge with all the latest and greatest, including audio paralleling and mesh technology. Both wireless chargers they will be releasing will work with any phone that has wireless charging capabilities and will mount to any Ram X grip phone mount in the market. All products were designed to meet the demands of the consumers in the industry. Their customers told them what they wanted and damn it, they built it for them. Lex and Moto will continue to build products the rider wants and needs and all backed with amazing warranties. Check out the info on all these latest products at LexandMotorcycle.com and use Fast Life at checkout to save yourself 10 or 15% off and give the team a follow on Instagram at Lex and Moto. John Jessup's Team Dream Rides is your hub in NorCal for all kinds of badass shit like bike builds, maintenance service dyno tuning i can go on the other great thing about this company is their website teamdreamrides.com they are bringing on new products regularly that was a hard one and now offering 100 days same as cash financing on all products all you need is a job and a bank account and that's it and you can also use fast life at checkout for 10 percent off so give the team and John, a follow at Dream Rides John on Instagram. I hope you guys are following Kevin and his team at Big Bear Performance. Uh, they're on Instagram as Big Bear Choppers. They've been investing their product line into parts that make your Harley perform, feel, and look amazing, along with being the industry leader in Olin suspension sales and service and tuning. Check out BigBearPerformance.com. See all the amazing products they make for your Harley Davidson, as well as Give Kevin a call, 909-479-7788. Let him answer any questions you have about some of the products he makes and produces from their company or about the Olin suspension and how that's going to help turn your bike into an amazing handling machine. So hit him up. Tell him the Fast Life Podcast sent you. Lindahl on everything has been a true statement for us here at Fast Life Garage. Lindahl makes some of the highest quality brake rotors, wheels on the market, backed by the best brake pads in the industry. Check out lindahlbrakes.com and see what they have for your bike. And don't forget to use Fast Life at checkout for 10% off. And stay up to date with the Lindahl team by following them at lindahlbrakes.com. Paint Huffer Metal Flake is the industry standard when it comes to flake and one of the key elements in helping your paint job stand out. Brian, who is also on this podcast today, is constantly on the grind pushing the boundaries and developing new products. Check out PaintHuffer.com. Use Fast Life at checkout for 10% off and follow Paint Huffer Metal Flake on Instagram. And stay up to date on all the product releases and works of art produced by many artists from around the world. Uh, thank you guys for joining us, man. It's, uh, it's uh, once again um, another podcast we recorded on this trip to Phoenix, Arizona, where we got to sit down with so many badass artists 
and builders and products and and clothing companies and and uh, this podcast man is heavy paint related man uh we, tim lowry is actually the the main guest but we also had dj who is another amazing painter uh, as well as brian who uh, owns paint paint hub for metal flake um we really just dived into all kinds of different aspects of this uh this you know this world of painters you know and uh tim lowry is a uh, kind of He's been, he's he's been a part of a lot of really badass custom painted bikes over the years, but his work really shines in the lowrider community, and um, he's a good friend, and I was really excited to have him on. So um, I'm just gonna jump to it and uh, let you guys hear from him. Here's Tim Lowry, DJ Brian, and me. Hey guys, you ready to let the dogs out? Fast life podcast. Life. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Tim Lowry, uh, how you say it? Tim Lowry, yo. You got that? You have me and my buddy NorCal. We used to talk about you behind your back. Oh. And we'd always say, you have the name that you can't say the first name only. You have to say the last name with it. Yeah. You know Tim Lowry down there? Like you have to. Yeah, say yeah. It. It's like one of those names. Yeah, I, I, I could be at any show. Hi, my name's Tim, and then they're like ignoring me, and then like you know, a few hours go by, and they come up to me. Oh, you're Tim fucking Lowry. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then they all start, you know, like, oh, I'm like, oh, calm down, calm down. Calm down. And so in your your uh, name is? DJ Gillespie. And you're from, he was telling me a little bit about you earlier. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not hip right. to all you That's painters all right. and Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm originally many. from California, but I've been here 22 years. Nice. So. And so you used to paint? F- you- I used to paint for Harley Davidson, actually, exclusively. For real? Their, their color shop, custom edition. Mm. limited editions and I uh, worked for a shop called AJ's Customs back in the day and uh, it was just mass produced yeah flag hours so in the custom paint world in in this yes it was damn I remember you know what's crazy is like uh, I've talked about this before but um, what was that Area 5150 back Mm -hmm. in the day like he asked me to come out here i was i sucked at the time i was no good at that. no way i could have made it right but he was like i guess he ran through so many artists out here and did people wrong that he pretty much had to look outside of uh what was the name of that guy? phoenix yeah wasn't, uh, wasn't that the, the shop that i took over uh no no what, what was his name do you remember oh uh, was it scott? scott it was scott. scott yeah who was the guy that i that i took over his spot when he left Mike Learn. Mike Learn. Oh, thank Learn, you, yeah. thank you, thank you. I took over Learn's old shop yeah. over by uh, in Tempe, over there by Dixon Flannel. Is Crash still out here painting? And stuff? He is. Yeah. He's uh, for a shop called uh, the Candy Shop. Candy Shop. Yep. Kind of uh, does his own. He has his shop on the side. Yeah. So, co- colors by Crash. Colors by Crash. Yeah. How how do you he's survive? Right, he's right across from Bugs. Bugs. Yeah. yeah he's he's really just Bugs. literally just. You walk 10 seconds in right there. How, how do you survive out here with that, though? Like with so many, so many, you know, painters. You know what I mean? It's, I don't know. It's difficult. It was, it was different when it was, you know, prior to 2008. And you had this shop and this shop cranking out 10 bikes a week and, you know, just mass production stuff. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as the, uh, the re- recession hit, you know. All these guys, a lot of guys, including Mike Learn, yeah, you know, they just went. Some of them became truckers. Some of them became real estate agents, and you never hear from them again. But most of them, um, yeah, they left state. And the guys who stayed here, which is of course me and um, Brian uh, Horseman, he's still up there. Yeah, he, he was he Cynthia, closed, right? Yeah. He just closed the shop down. Yeah, he's still. I heard he's still painting though. Right, but. Yeah. Um, Dino's is still around, believe it or not. I still work for Dean. Right, right. Uh, Tom Stevenson. T Step, yeah. T Step. Yourself. Yeah. Matt. Matt. Matt and uh, a few others. Yeah, it was uh, it was it was weird. Like from the outside looking in, being in in you know Texas and whatnot, and just seeing. You know, this was like the epicenter of the custom paint world for the when the chopper thing was going on because you really didn't have many painters on the East Coast that were making a big name. You had nubs and stuff like that with Mm -hmm. Orange County and those guys, but you know, here you had like these mass produced shops making, you know, Dinos and like all these people that were they were cranking out badass paint jobs. I mean, they were really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh for mass production. I mean you're you, you know 
you're not getting like that one-off flavor but you know me and brian were talking about it like how do you how do you replicate that again it's like you need bikes that are small that pay a shit ton of money instead of like baggers where you have like 15 pieces and, right and they want to pay four grand for it and shit you know yeah so how'd you how'd you get into this like like were you are you originally from here are you a transplant or i was born here yeah yeah you know phoenix arizona how'd you like what was your start into the whole custom paint thing um well i've been airbrushing since 1989 damn and actually next month will be um the 30 year mark damn. and i picked it up in high school so um i had always been just doing you know illustrations murals stuff like that mm -hmm. and then after high school i started doing t-shirts which didn't last long because you know I, it wasn't paying well enough mm -hmm. bottom line um but then i just went to a regular nine to five job for like, like 15 years you know and, and that was something i did on the side you know yeah until uh 2006 i actually quit you know a full nine to five job and <clears throat> started doing automotive stuff yeah so did you get into the bikes first or was it the car thing first? It was bikes. Yeah. The shop that I was working for, they were just doing bikes. You know, it was just a little shop. It was just a painter and me, the artist. So Yeah. That's kind of when I first got into this industry, that's the shop I went into was a painter, an airbrush guy, and then I wet sanded. Right. Like that was the thing. And uh, and it was like 2004. So it's like, right. Right on, like, it was booming with the chopper thing, yeah. but it wasn't, like, I guess it wasn't peaked yet. I yeah. want to say, like, probably 2005 or six is when it really peaked. Right. Maybe. I don't know. Probably. But, so where were you at? Like, what was your deal? You know, uh, I was a mechanic turning wrenches, and I was climbing up on the back of a truck to unload a pallet and broke my leg, compound fracture. Damn. And there was a shop called Drew Brothers Customs that was right up the street, and, uh, I was like, Tim, I, I started on t-shirts back in the day, but <clears throat> anyways, I went and visited my uh, buddy that I met and uh, he was looking for an artist. And honestly, I, I just knew t-shirts. I didn't know how to put it on metal. Mm -hmm. And this is around the same time uh, Motorcycle Mania came out with Jesse James, of course. Mm -hmm. And I just saw the bikes on there. I'm like, shit, dude, I want to learn that. And I'm not kidding you. I went by my house. I hit up the street on Broadway and the first shop was like, uh, Orlando's Shane Orlando's and then mm -hmm. he's like no, I'm not looking for a painter and I went up the next shop and it was a shop called creative coloring the guy's name was Denny Bloom and uh, he's pretty pretty big name back in back in the day mm -hmm. and I, I practically started like six bucks an hour <laughs> it was unreal but he taught me everything yeah from, from body to prime on up until he trusted me enough to clear yeah and uh the rest is history, I guess. Yeah, it's a, it's man, it's it's weird how how some of us start in this shit. You know what I mean? Like, I I, I grew up in a paint and body shop. You know, my dad had one, but I was a paint and body kid, wet sanding cars and and grinding fenders, and never never exposed to air custom paint because all we did was like restoration on cars and whatnot. And I hated it. I didn't want to do this shit. So. It's weird when you see people that found art before they found the paint part of it. You know what I mean? It's not weird, but it's just it's just different than than the world that I grew up in. You know what right, I mean? Yeah. I had the art love because I was into comics and drawing and stuff. But you know, you you draw comics or you draw that shit as a kid in high school, and you're like, you know, there's no career in this. You know, I'm not that good of an artist to draw for comics, and you know that would. I, those kind of careers weren't really as exposed as they are now. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I don't know, man. It's a, it's, it's a crazy thing how like a lot of people find these different paths into the custom paint world. You know what I mean? Um, well, I was thinking about like with you in, in the, in the bikes, like I want to say like, I really, you came on my radar a lot more probably when the big wheel thing was kind of taking place and yeah, you were yeah. doing a lot of the still vision garage or what was his shot before that? Um, Actually, we were we were uh, spooky fast. Spooky fast. We were at, we were at spooky fast. We quit, and then we went back to um, Steel Vision, mm -hmm. and then I quit from there, and then he went on his own. So, so when you in two thousand six is what you said. So, what was the first step into the paint for you? Um, well, I was I was pretty much scared of your thing. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to mix it or yeah. anything. So. 
one of my best friends was uh, he was working for Dinos for a long time. Yeah. You know, just cranking out like, like real fire and everything like that. And uh, I would go by his shop every once in a while and just hang out and we'd just talk. And I'll see him wet sanding one day, another day he would be airbrushing and then he'd be in the booth clearing and stuff like that. And so that pretty much opened up my eyes to it. And as soon as I quit my job, I found a place to work at. And I was there for close to five years, a mm -hmm. uh, place called Bad Boy Designs. So was it like a lot of time behind the airbrush just getting used to it and things like that? Or did you already kind of... I was already, I was really uh, uh, proficient with it. So you, did you still kind of practice over the years when you had the full-time job still? Were you still? Oh yeah, I still did side stuff. Okay. And, but the thing is, I, I, you know, an artist's mind, it just never stops. Yeah. It just keeps continually, just keep going and going. And even though I wasn't airbrushing, I was still like paying attention. I was, you know, just yeah. drawing and just getting better at, at shading and lighting and stuff like that. Um, and then that just translated into the airbrush, just just like that, mm -hmm. you know. That's one of the things that's probably the most important thing about being a proficient airbrush artist is once you learn lighting, because that changed that that changes a lot of the look of everything, man. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the th like, what was it for you like with the big wheel stuff? I mean, you kind of had like I feel like we all had to do it. I mean, I like the bikes. I don't get me wrong, but you know, as a painter, like we had to paint what was the end thing, right? So, I mean, yeah. what was that, the crowd like that? I mean, did you, in 2006, you were painting, you had to be doing choppers and shit, right? Yeah, we were doing mostly just choppers and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And we had accounts mostly with people who had uh, crotch rockets. Mm. And those are a uh, pain in the ass. To yeah. Paint, you know, because there is no frame or jig to, you know, you get a Harley frame, you could slap a bagger on it. This, I would have to construct all these, like, wooden beans and stuff yeah to get and, the flow from side know, to side you putting clips putting these plastic yeah. parts together here and there just so everything matches up so when it gets put together it, it matches flows, up yeah. yeah so that was the pain in the ass um, well, so that's what I was doing too at the time I, I was in the sport bikes right when the chopper thing right. was big I had a job painting but my thing my pat, my passion was the sport bikes and because of that reason I ended up just taking like being like hey dude just bring me your whole bike I'll right. take it apart because I need to be able to throw the parts back on there and yep. see the flow. Yep. And so that's what helped me learn how to wrench a little bit over the years. Oh, okay. You know, taking those bikes on and off. And then next year, you know, I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to build one and drop a motor out of this motherfucker and, right. and go from there. So what about you? Like, You know, I think still to this day, that's probably one of my, my worst fears is the sides and the bags lining everything up. And sometimes yeah. you don't have the opportunity of having the frame there to mock it all up. And yeah. it's, you, you kind of... It's a guess, and uh, luckily nine times out of ten, it it's close enough where you know the pinstripes help sometimes. Yeah, and close line, enough counts, right? It, it counts <laughs> when those bags line up. Stand back. The best thing is when people started molding side covers to bags that made things so much faster. It was almost right, like right. as a shop, I would be more willing to offer that service at a very cheap rate just because of the anxiety that comes with the bag and side cover alignment. Yeah. You know. Yeah, you still had to deal with the rear fender and the tank to the side cover, but you know at least I got rid of one big fucking spot. It was the biggest yeah. spot of connecting, yeah. you know. But yeah, yeah. That, that would be, you know, look, looking back, it, I was lucky enough to uh, go to school for this. It was a uh, airbrush and science school in uh, California. Oh Chino. shit, they had one of those. Yeah, and you know they need that. They need that shit again. You know they need more of those classes. For this trade, because I, I do feel it is a, it's a dying art. It, it, is, it yeah. really is. That, that's how I feel about it. It's dying. It's dying because uh, you know I'm, I'm trying to pay attention across the whole board of where's the new, Newbies. twenty year old guy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you don't see any, hardly anybody out there coming out. The school that you were at was that like a collegiate school? It, it was. Uh, it was another school attached to the high school. Oh, okay. It was a trade school. Like a yeah. vocation. Like a vocation school. Exactly. That's, that's what, what we was. had. Where it's a vocation. Yeah, that's yeah. what I had too. Yeah. Yeah. But the crazy it thing is the ones we had in Sunday. Dallas, like they'd have the airbrush classes, but you walk in, it's like everybody had a Craig Fraser stencil laid out on the table. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like Yeah. The problem is is that these schools like the the from what I've seen in my last fifteen years in this stuff is that the, the school would have a teacher that didn't really know the 
trade very well. Right. Yeah. But, you know, she, they, you know, because most of those schools, you have to have a degree to yeah. have that. Yeah. And I don't know many airbrush artists with fucking degrees. That's true. Because if we had degrees, we wouldn't be doing this shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, there's, it's kind of a weird kind of place to be, but. It, it was kind of like that in, in a sense. It was like, here's your Pache single action. You know, learn on it. And I, I'm not kidding you. I learned on it for a year. And I regret it to this day. It's like, you know, double action. It just made you. Yeah. <laughs> it held you back. So it, you, it did. So yeah. you were good at yes, doing exactly. that sort of deal. Adjusting it <laughs> yeah. and yeah. back and forth. Yeah, the, I don't, I, 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 man, I really, t- I don't know if, I, I kind of agree with the, the lost trade, but at the same time, I feel like right now, there's more and more people trying to learn this this trade and this craft. And I don't know. I, I think that the sign painting thing, I will 100% agree, agree because with that, that whole thing's been phased out with printers, right? But I, I personally, my favorite painters in the industry are sign painter background guys. Like those dudes have right. a, a, a pinstripe, a brush control. Yeah. They're... Their work is always super clean because of the things they learn in the sign painting, like uh, apprenticeships that they would do. Yeah, you know, and um, when you when it comes to airbrush, man, it's like, dude, it's it's so across the board from what, how like how could you even put a curriculum and say like, oh well, you know, we're teaching Corey St. Clair realism, but then you come in with your style that's equally as badass, but it's definitely not like a realism. It's more of a a low rider traditional. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. kind of like yeah. tattoos now. You know what yeah. I mean? So it kind of gets in a weird place. And then the I think the second thing when you have to talk about a school, like you have to have a career to sell kids on the after of the school. And while we are all kind of, you know, uh, products of a career in custom paint, I mean, I mean, is everything positive on y'all's ends? Do y'all think this is the best thing in the world or, you know, ups and downs? As far as we yeah. It, it's it's ups and downs for yeah. me. Yeah, I, I mean, last month was probably one of the best years I've had in three years. Mm-hmm. So and then this month, once this month started, it started slowing down because you know we're ramping up to the holidays and stuff, and and that's where it really just drops yeah. right off. You know, um, usually, but usually in the summers it's dead for me, mm-hmm. like, absolutely dead. But luckily with the lowrider stuff, it picks up because we have shows. In, mm-hmm. in like July and August, low rider shows. Yeah, you got Taurus show, and then you got the super show here. And the Vegas show. The Vegas show. So, you know, all these shows, everybody wants them last minute. Like, all right, we'll bring them down. You're going to pay for it, though. Mm-hmm. That, that, I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> there, there's, you know, we all deal with the, uh, the, the deadlines, last minute, change of minds. I mean, a custom paint you the list is endless on uh, things thrown at you you know mm-hmm. you, it's like you have to adapt and you know would you say let me ask you I, the guys this question real quick I don't have deadlines yeah I state from um, day one you don't put a deadline on me so it's great for me I'm sorry about that <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm not at your level yet so you know as far, yeah, definitely. but as far as a dying art I mean I think on paint huffer I've got probably just in the past 10 minutes two different questions on how do I do this and how do I do that. Yeah. I don't know if it's dying. You know, I think it's our job to constantly help and produce and keep it alive. I mean, obviously, but I don't know. I'm stoked when I hear stuff like that. Some people look at that as like a pain in the ass to answer questions all night long, but I try to answer everybody and I'm like, Hey, you know, do this or do that. I'll help you out any way I possibly can. I remember back in the day I called coast airbrush and some lady answered the phone and she was a sweetheart. Like she helped me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, on the phone. I'm like, motherfucker, dude, if I ever had a company, I would be the same exact way. Right. And I get hit that like three in the morning, I'll get somebody in Italy that'll hit me up and be like, you know, the broken English and not really knowing what they're trying to say, but I'll give them the time and that goes tenfold. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that we're keeping the industry alive. Or keeping that fire lit that way. Well, you got to think about like, what really what really puts fire under the the want to learn, and I think it has to do with like like you said the mon the, you know the motorcycle mania, seeing all that shit on TV, you know, almost twenty years ago, fifteen years ago, whatever. Like you see that shit, and you're like, oh, what is this? Yeah. This is an art form that people get paid to do. That's not like graphic design or something right. like that. That's yeah. you know what I mean. And we just 
as an industry, we really haven't had a uh, a media influx of of our culture in a good way. Not not that it's been in a bad way, but you know, you look at a lot of TV shows, and which is the only thing that's like a mass media produced kind of thing, where you'll see like custom paint, like pushed into your your into your TV set that you don't know shit about this world. I mean, if you follow all this stuff on Instagram, that's all you see every day. But you know, if you're just turning on TV and you're watching Counts Customs and you're seeing Ryan and and those dudes over there painting, that's different. But you know, you see show after show after show on TV talking about like flipping cars and doing this and metal and and all this. Everybody's trying to jump on that Jesse James bandwagon of like be some kind of creator, but no one's ever looked at paint. And I was surprised yeah. because you would have yeah. thought that somebody like Hugh King mm-hmm. or somebody like that would have done a TV show, branched off and came into a maybe some type of a paint competition. Hugh King was the guy that did all the biker build offs back in the yeah. day. Billy Lane versus Matt Hodge, Matt Hodge versus mm-hmm. whoever. Yeah. And I always thought that. I'm like, why wasn't there anybody in the custom paint room? Because we have such a a niche market is that why maybe it's a little bit off but same thing with the bikers though i mean it was a niche market but i remember watching you know jesse james building bikes and before he was or just coming up and being like what the fuck yeah. dude you can do that to a bike or you can do that i type remember of job i remember watching matt hodge pays 25 grand for a flame job on a bike that was blue with white flames I remember that bike yeah and i'm like uh, yeah, let's get into that industry. <laughs> Son, me. And then by the time I got good, we didn't have that kind of money in it anymore. <laughs> I think the prices have changed from then till now as well. You know. Yeah. yeah. Do you see the lowrider industry? And this is something I've always been curious about. Because you can get paid very well on a certain job. It's always different clientele. But do you get hit up, I mean, probably constantly like, hey, bro, can you paint my my car for like you know two grand and I'll get you all this every you know advertising and business? Do you get hit up constantly by a lot of those cheap guys or from the car the clubs time, and yeah. stuff? And they're like, yeah. "Come on, Tim, I'll make you famous. I'll yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll I, give you." You know how you can stop that, right? Oh no, I tell them, you know, I don't care about that. You know, right. I don't care about how many jobs you say you're gonna bring in, right? Or you're promising or whatever. Yeah. But I just say. You know, this is what it's going to cost, mm-hmm. and I don't care what referral referrals are coming to me, mm-hmm. and that just shuts them down quick. Just so, look at their Instagram, so. and when they it's got the four hundred people, though. like exactly, yeah. hey, you got how many friends? Yeah, yeah. 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 five followers or something, and they're or they're or you could just tell them, well, bring me those cars first, then I'll paint yours for two grand. Yeah. You know, do you do you <laughs> set your structure happened. up? And I don't I don't need to know what you get paid or anything like that. But do you set yourself up as a template now? Do we, do you go, hey, look, this is what. I'm gonna work on, and this is. I how do. I, I have a, a strict guideline. Um, I, it's a lot like a tattoo artist yep. would approach their job. I get mm-hmm. deposits, yep. and that saves a date. Nice. And not only that, but that gets a rendering started. Mm-hmm. So if he doesn't, um, you know, pony up on his end, right? He doesn't get that rendering back. I could take it and apply we do it that to in another the tattoo. Job. I own a tattoo shop as well. And I do right. that same thing yeah. in, in, yeah, in our exactly. industry as well. Yeah. Danny D was telling me one time. He goes, you know. I'll take a, a deposit and I'll have them come in and they'll work. I'll work on their car. And I'm sure you see this often too. And we see this in Paint Huffer as well, where they'll come in, put that deposit down. They'll want to get in on your list. And then the next week they're hitting you up. Hey man, have you started it? Are you on it? Are you ready to go? Yeah. You go to it? You get it? Right. Same thing with Paint Huffer where they'll put an order in and then like five minutes later, hey man, you got a tracking number for me? And I'm like, look, you're on this list. And daddy was telling me, he goes, you know what, man? I don't even get stressed out anymore. I have him walk into my shop. Look at a board, and I say, "See that number? That's you." Yeah. When I get to you, I'll be yep. with you. That's you know, what I that's have. To, I have a board, and it, right now it's probably got like six on the list. Mm-hmm. So it goes from one to six. Mm-hmm. So this guy, he came, he paid a deposit last August. Nice. And then now his his job got dropped off this morning, and that's the one I'm working on. Yeah. And then two, three, and four, and then it just you know once it's done, erased. Another one will fill that slot. So mm-hmm. I'm right now. I'm booked till November. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, I like to try to stay booked at least like three months in advance for the most part, yeah. and uh, it it gives me the peace of mind. Not because if you don't book yourself in advance, then you mm-hmm. get into a phase where you're like, "Fuck, man! Like I need to make sure there's work next month yeah, for yeah. rent." You start. So you when start you book in advance, right? like you're you can. It's funny how like it's kind of like when you have money and you keep saving money. Right. Right. If I already mm-hmm. have. 
two months of savings and throwing a couple more dollars every other day. So yeah. you, you'll get those random conversations on uh, Instagram or Facebook, wherever you do your business at. And sure. they'll be like, hey, man, I'm interested in a paint job. And I'm like, yeah, let's do this. Uh, I got an opening in November right now, uh, November 15th. I could probably take it in. I'm not saying I start on it, but that's kind of the opening as long as everything else before you gets done by that time right. and goes from there. And then you're like, fuck, bam, they put a deposit down. You know, which I, I do like a scheduled deposit. Then when the when the time is to do the bike, mm-hmm. then it's a they complete a fifty percent deposit. That's what Excellent. I do too. Yeah. So and that's, that's, the same thing that's exactly tattoo. what I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I take like two hundred bucks to to get on the schedule. Yep. Sure. And they're not getting that shit back. Yep. And non non refundable deposit. Yeah. And yep. I, I don't want to. Yep. I don't want to fucking full half deposit three months before I get the job because I'll have blow you, that shit. Have you yeah. ever booked out <laughs> further than three months? Have you gone like a year out or you? No, year I'm not that. Out? I'm not OG. And see, that's able yet. <laughs> when I when I was tattooing heavily, I was going out about four or five months. People were like, "Oh, we'll wait you know for what, you. Though? Wait for you." But it's too long. I got. I got. For me, you know, I don't know if this applies to you, but this is for me. Is that when I book myself too far in advance, mm-hmm. I feel like. I have evolved as an artist since that three or four month prior. Sure. And like I go through phases with my shit. You know what I mean? Like my right. style, it, it evolves and changes. Right. Like I have I have paint jobs on helmets that I've done like two years ago that I just cannot physically make myself do the simplicity of it yeah. anymore. I don't yeah. see it the same way. So as I'm changing and evolving, like I never know when like you'll do like five helmets and then I'll be like I'm fucking over this style and then like you go in the fuck you're sketching you're drawing and then bam something new comes along and that just happens to be the next helmet that he was in love with the style you were doing or the that you know what I mean I know exactly what you mean that and the other thing that used to really fucking bug me I don't know if you guys do this but when I when I would take a deposit I would make it crystal clear exactly the job that I'm doing because a lot of times I get a call back. I had a guy one time in Canada that kept calling me and he goes, you know what, man? I'm a big Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I want to have some you know, black in there. I want to have some gold in there. I want to have this in there. And I'm like, man, you told me blues. Like that was completely 180 difference than what I had started already and I agreed to. Do you guys do a format to where you say, look, this is what I'm going to work on. This is the portrait that I'm going to do. I'm not changing it. You know, you know what's funny? I think I think it's always easier for us to sell it higher, but never take away money out of the deal. Right, <laughs> right, you know? right. Yeah. Like it's kind of a fucked up deal. Totally. It's like being honest, like you know. But you but you always get those people that want to add to it. Okay, well, man, can you go and throw this in for me for free? That's where I was going. I don't. You know what? I don't get I'm that like, shit. Man. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Call, I don't get that either. Mm-hmm. Um, do, you, do you have do you have customers that request that though? Like after you start a job, be like, hey, you know what? Can you do this for me real quick? Very mm-hmm. rarely, but I I let them know. I tell them this wasn't on the original render. Exactly. Therefore, your price is going to be changed accordingly. Yeah. And they understand it, and so they pony up. Yep. Definitely. I think I've seen people get abused that way or have to resend. Well, you got to you got to stand your ground in a very yeah, you professional do. way. To where you're, you know, and I'm, I'm not the most professional, but you, you have to do it to where, you know, it, it goes back to this thing I've been trying to, like, find the best way to explain. It's like, we all think we're doing art, but we're selling fucking materials, right? Material possessions. And until, we, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a mindset of how you, like, sell your work, how you do your work, how you schedule your work, how you, you know, how you even, like, give and present the work it's It's art if you put it in as art then you get respected as art right if you're just going to be another paint job on a bike or a hood a a mural on a hood they're going to treat you like that and they're never going to value your product they're never going to value the fact that they got a tim lowry hood painted or you know murals or or whatever the case may be so it 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 kind of goes back to that whole like you know it's how you like how you portray yourself in this industry and i i was curious because i i I dabbled in the lowrider thing for a while, mm-hmm. and I wasn't really good whenever I was doing it. I was very early on in my airbrush career, and really quickly, I just felt like the scene was – it didn't value art. It, it was all about art, you know? Right. The, everybody liked this, you know, everything's about art in the lowrider community, but then when you look at the finished products and half the cars at the shows, you're like, what the fuck? But then you look at the business side of it, and you look at, like, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago – you know, you're, you had uh, you had Fonzie who was transitioning into tattoos. Tattoos, yep. yeah. You had OG Abel who was already doing a killing, like killing Clothing. the fucking clothing. Yeah. So yeah. he couldn't really pr- provide. 
you had Big Shadow out of Dallas, which his style was always kind of, you know, it, it was kind of primitive airbrush work at the time. And then, you know, fuck, man, like, you had, what was it, Albert, the, Alberto Herrera. Yeah, his shit yeah. was, like, I, I, I hate to say it this way, but I felt like 10 years ago, that dude had some of the sickest shit in the game. It was. Uh, I remember seeing a lot of his stuff back in 2007 at the uh, yeah. uh, Las Vegas Super Show. Yeah, and I was taking pictures. He of did all fucking the L cars. Ray. And he had the no, 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 did, no, Fonzie didn't do L Ray. Fucking uh, the bike. No, the the car. Oh, the um, L Ray that was Sal Elias. Sal, that's yeah. right, dude. That that fucking thing was sick. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. remember because uh, I used to work for Sam Torres, and uh, when he did the first show in L A, I was actually there uh, as like just working for the company. That's when he did the Ice Cube. Yeah, yeah, I did the Ice Cube, but that's also when I met. Um, we talked about him. He, he uh, fucking Steve Demand. I met him. Yeah, I met Steve, all yeah. those dudes. Fonzie, all like it was like an airbrush artist dream. Like going to fucking right. L.A. and everybody <laughs> I've been following for years is just sitting mm-hmm. out there walking by like regular guys and shit. I'm like, you know, you're famous, right? That's <laughs> but, awesome. So how was it? Like, what kind of put you into like wanting to go towards the lowrider thing? I mean, was it just the I've I've always loved lowrider artwork. Yeah. You know, I used to go to the shows when I was thirteen and fourteen, and that's what it was specifically for, just the artwork. That's yeah. all I wanted to see was the artwork and the girls. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it always been in my mind that, you know, that's what I like, man. This yeah. Just badass stuff. Yeah, you your know? your style, like, and, I, and I, I'm i trying to, I remember some of the bikes you did, like, I think you did a, you did quite a few, and they always had that, that look, that softness of, like, a lowrider style airbrush right, thing. Right. And, um recently like when i knew i was coming down here i was just like just fucking like nerding out going down the timeline i'm like fuck dude like you've been killing it i think you nailed that dude with the whole softness thing when i see your work it is so perfect but it's soft it has that feel to it and i think that's very awesome that you have that uniqueness about you that yeah. to keep to create a style it's kind of hard in, in such a yeah well, well i'm not really going for you know um like a Corey St. Clair look, yeah. like really super detailed, overly yeah. detailed and stuff like that. I, I just, I kind of want it cartoon style. Yeah. But, you know, with more accurate, like shading, highlighting. Yeah, you have a lot like of, that. you have a lot of lighting effects in a lot of the things yeah. you do. Have but you still have the saturations in there too for the contrast. I think that's something that's, you know, you have to have as an artist. I've seen guys where they've gone light and softness and it's too light. Yeah. You know, you're like, okay, yeah. shadows in your nose, under your eyes, and yeah. stuff like that are missing. It and it, very it can be the, the entire mural itself. Mm-hmm. You know, certain uh, car owners, they'll say, well, I want it really light. I want it really ghosted. Yeah. I'm going to mm-hmm. barely see this thing. Okay, so I know what to do. I can't use candies because once you start stacking those colors, yeah. it gets darker and darker. So You know, I have a quick question for you, though. On yeah. that, do you do your values from light to dark? I've, I mean, I've seen you work where you and I were you know, right next to each other, and you were working on a piece in front of me, and I've seen you go from light. Do you do your contrast afterwards, or are you going from dark to light? I, I usually what I call knockouts, like in the comic book industry. Mm -hmm. So you have this page of artwork and you see those little X's everywhere. That's a knockout. He's just going to go in there and just bomb, just black, just black it out. Mm -hmm. Get his full saturation contrast around it just to influence or know how much the contrast is. So so you're boxing it in? Yes. Okay. So you're getting your, your, darkest darks yes and building from it's there it's kind of yeah. like landmarks like yeah. you know the nostrils they're dark you're going to go in there and make those dark and then where whatever other parts and so, that just gives you a kind of bearing and it just starts closing down all the whole sections of yeah because if you i mean it, like say if your darkest is like a couple shades darker than the car right you're not doing if you did a bl- like pitch like true black then your whole image is going to be bright Right. That's right. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that makes a lot of that. sense. I didn't. I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah. that's why I was kind of curious of how you did that, too, because I've seen you work in person, mm-hmm. and I've seen you build up those values and whatnot. Same thing in the tattoo industry. If I do something, if I do a portrait, I'm starting with the eyes. It's always eyes, nose, and mouth. Right. 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 And I've seen you have that. I mean, you obviously know right. your artistic. Yeah, and that and way. that's where that comes in. You, you get a, a better gauge of how much shading you're going to put throughout the face and stuff. Because if you just started in there... And you didn't have all these dark areas the to know how, how dark this is. This right here looks light. And then you stick those darks in last. And then your face is dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And you're like, you're like, fuck, I made a dark face. Yeah. What am I going to do? Start like, over, you know? Yeah. You know, one thing uh, about, like, doing, like, murals on hoods and door jams or wherever the case you're doing them, it's always, like, it, it's always a planned out thing, right? So yeah. you, you have this, you know, you're, you're, you're working on your composition or whatnot. And I've always felt like that in itself is so much more time and work to figure out mm-hmm. than the actual execution of the actual artwork. Fuck yeah. yeah. And yeah. so I did a couple of them and I was like, fuck this. <laughs> you know but I mean? you also have to yeah. have flow too, though, because I've seen yeah. a lot of people take stuff now. And nowadays you can take an iPad. I use Procreate, but if I'm going to do a, a whole sleeve, right, on somebody and they want five different images, you can stack those images. But what happens is a lot of times people will butt those images up next to each other yeah. without overlays. When you look at a tattoo sleeve or somebody that has like right here, like even on my sleeve, it's very like cookie cutter. Boom, yeah. boom, boom, one image just spread out. But that flowness, now when you do something like that, Tim or even Jace, when you guys put something together, do you put together all your images and then flow afterwards, or are you flowing beforehand? Do you have an idea in your head? I, I, yeah, I have the idea of what it's gonna sp- or supposed to look like, mm-hmm. and then I just grab my images, you know, Frankenstein and stuff like that, and then work the flow in as I go along. Yeah, because most it's customers really, are gonna be like, "Hey, I want this. I want some poker chips and some." One another reason why I got out of low riders paint hundred dollar bills. I'm over that shit. I'm oh never yeah, hundred dollar bills yeah. with the with Dude. the roses. Just no, not even <laughs> that. Just yeah. painting a hundred dollar yeah. bill. That, like that's the most why it was the tattoo industry too. Is that God. way? Every, that's why if you notice in all my murals, I'll just paint a corner. Yeah, the, uh, it's not going to be. You'd see that with a lot of people. One, man, you know, it's pops, just dude. I try to narrow it down. Just you're barely seeing the hundred dollar. Uh, letters right there. I would. I. I, I just. The numbers. Oh my god! I hate it. Do you do you do um, sketches at first? Like, will you take like a piece of vellum and draw out all your images first? Or yeah, I'll do? I'll take a sheet of paper and just make like ten thumbnails of okay. the idea of what he's what he wants. Right. And from there, I'll kind of you know like I don't like this one. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's flesh out this one more. Do you do like one. a flip book to where you're doing the no. flow on top of it? Okay, because no. that's how I would do it. I was always stacking like, you know, let's say skull, roses, whatever, yeah. right? Gotcha. And then I would flow on top of that until I got right. to the final draft. Nowadays, we can do that digitally. Do you yeah. do a lot of stuff on the iPads or do I, you I, do? I use Photoshop. Photoshop, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. W- when I flesh out my drawing, mm-hmm. I'll take it and scan it, put it in Photoshop. And from there, say if that rose is too big, I could cut it, scale it. Paste it and then start, you know, nice. moving Scaling, around stuff yeah. like that. Exactly. Yeah, that that uh, and are you using anything, Jace, for yours? When you do, do you use? You know, it's kind of funny because I'm, I'm starting to rate? realize things I didn't even like think about in my path. You know what I mean? It's like I did the the one of the only hood murals I ever really did that was like I'm kind of proud of is uh, but I did like this like shield and it had graphics around it and that's I think that's kind of something I've always. I, I've liked, uh, you know what I think it is? It's just my way of getting away with shit. Because when you add a frame to it, especially a taped out frame or a graphic, you kind of, you feel the space more and you kind of give it a different element than like say if you look at some some of the airbrush that you do where you kind of fade out this mural into yeah. into the, into bot. I'm not good at that kind of airbrush right. at all. Like, and now that, now that hearing how you did your nostril, I'm like, that's it. <laughs> Now, now I'm ready to go home and try it. Yeah. <laughs> you right? know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's those kind of simplistic, like, when you do this shit for a living or, like, you see a style of artwork and you want to try it, sometimes it's that. It's that one little bitty fucking thing that you're just overlooking and it's the ju- it, that judges the entire piece. Absolutely. If you create your dark, yeah, dude, if you create your darkest spots at the first, then you you can balance the whole whole fucking thing off I of that. I was curious it's crazy. about that. Yeah, just how you came yeah. up with all Sorry, that. I was just thinking yeah. about that. Yeah. No, I love yeah. boxing. What were we talking about the nostrils, though? What were you saying? Well, the, what Jace asked was, or what you refer to is, do I build my colors up? Mm-hmm. You know, and like I uh, said was, I just... Do all my darks first. Yes. And then go from there. Say, like, Today. if it, it's really dark in the nostril, I'll just go in there, so it. dark, and it's done. Dark as is. And then, you know, the light shades around it and stuff like that. I see yeah. a lot of new artists that come in and do that, but they do the opposite. And then where they, it, the whole piece looks flat. It, right. It's, they have it right. I mean, it looks like Marilyn Monroe, and it's perfect. You can tell that it's her, but it's a very faint. Right. And they don't right. understand saturation. It, yeah, because you don't have control of your tones when you're doing that. You know, one of the things like with the way I airbrush right now is I have had such a 
uh, an influx of like Ryan Townsend and, and Corey St. Clair that I look for so much fine detail that it, you know, like I'm scared to paint a chick, dude. Yeah. Like I'm, I feel like I'm gonna make her look like an old lady just because I'm gonna be putting so many fucking wrinkles. Right. Well, let me like, ask you, yeah. Jace, have you ever messed with like Prisma colors or done anything like that at all? Yeah, oh, like, in high school, yeah. 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 Oh. So like that was the way that I learned. Like I have some stuff here, even at Paint Huffer, that I have that I've drawn faces because I was like, fuck, I don't want to do a pinup. But then I would go in there and draw it with the Prismas because you could. Who cares? Yeah. It's on fucking vellum. I'm not going to fuck somebody's right. arm up. Right. But building those values up and building that confidence up, do you feel, I mean, I feel now, if I was to hire you, you could do something on the fly. Has your confidence level gotten to that part now where you're not doing any pre-work beforehand? Or do you still do a lot of like s- sketches and stuff like that? I, I still do, yeah. Yeah, especially if... Especially if they're for customers, mm-hmm. he has to approve it. Yeah, sure. you know, he doesn't that's where approve the it. Then I don't move yeah. move into uh, paint yet. Yeah. So. You know, you ever hear those painters that say like, "Oh, you know, well, I'm not going to do a sketch because you know this, that, and the other." It's like I don't want that anxiety of like hoping they like what I did. You know what right. I mean? That's exactly right. where I was exactly. going because you got this person who's going to be spending X amount of money, and if it's a large amount, and then all of a sudden, surprise, you're not getting paid. Well, there's two there's two things for that for me. I think that for one tape. And time is very expensive, Fuck so yeah, I would rather I'd rather spend one night over a couple of beers at home at my art table working out colors and working out lines and working out Ooh. ideas. Yeah, and I see as you opposed do that. to doing you the post, shit. You post a lot of your stuff about that. Yeah, and you know I tell cool. I'm not fucking chip foos, man. I'm not in here no. with a goddamn airbrush doing fades. I think that's shit. overboard. Yeah, well, Just I wish I I, I wish could. I could. Yeah, but I, but I personally, I mean, I don't I don't think you need. But, I think that's good for the show, and that Chip is an amazing artist. Yeah, I mean, he's phenomenal. Right. There, there's just figuring that shit out makes it so much easier because one of the hardest things about starting a project is kind of like you you see the jump rope going, and all you got to do is like get in it, and yeah. once you're in it, you're in it. Yeah, you know, and sometimes for a lot of artists that that first jump in it, it's like, oh man, I don't, if I jump in there now, I'm stuck there for the next three days. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to do it. And then what happens is for a lot, of, at least for me and other artists I've talked to, like, fuck, man, I kept putting this off, putting this off, putting this off. And then I jumped in it and I was done in four hours. That's right. yeah. I thought it was going to take two days. Yeah. I just, it just went. But, you know, it, we get weird, man. Like, we're fucking weird people, man. It's the same thing in the tattoo industry. A lot of people back in the day would draw up script. If I'm going to do, like, you know, mm-hmm. write out Lowry on your arm or something, right. people would do that on a piece of paper and we'd write it all the way out. And then I was like, Fuck this shit, dude. I'm taking a scribe or I'm taking a Sharpie and just going to draw it up on you. Right. Dude, it's like all about cart- printing out the Edwardian script. Son. Cartoon one yeah. time. I met him years ago and he was like, hey, hold this t-shirt up to your chest. I was like, okay. I held this shirt up and he drew this whole fucking mural that said cartoon. But he did with the eyes and the nose and everything. That's where I kind of was like, all right, fuck it. I'm no longer going to do the stencil part of it. I'm just going to go for it Mm -hmm. and do the flow. And I think sometimes, do you find that in the airbrush world? I don't know if you guys, because I'm not an airbrush artist, but do you guys find that where it's easier just to go with the flow live on a certain part? Because everything is not always flat. Like in the tattoo right. world, you have all these contours, your arms are, you know, everything's going to be a circular motion, right? Mm-hmm. Do you find that as well in the airbrush? Sometimes you just like, you can, you can't draw like this ghost flame or whatever it is out on a piece of paper first. No, no. You have to just ad lib and go for that yeah, part we, of it, Yeah, for right? stuff like that, yeah. Okay. You would just go with it, you know. That makes sense on there. And you just, that's where your expertise and confidence and you're going to be like, look, I got this. It's going to come into right. play. And sometimes, and, and you've probably ran into it a lot, you know, where the part is so just, you know, especially the side cover and yeah. going into the bag. And, you know, how do you put this skull or whatever, you know, yeah. you have to stretch a little bit of it this way and that way. So when you're looking at it at this angle, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, because if you didn't, you know, it, yeah, it's the same thing distorted, like with, with so. like our helmets that we do. Mm-hmm. The reason I picked that spot on top to do faces is because it's the flattest part of the helmet. Right, right really back there, and right? There's not, right. Yeah, right in the, yeah, at the very top. And your oh, faces are going to look contorted. Yeah, because yeah, right. if you put too many body lines in it, then you get weird angles and things like that. But, Definitely. you know, and then the other reason why I do the helmets the way I do is because I want to offer one item on the menu. One style. <laughs> nice. One, like... Let me let me fucking sell this out until there's no more left on the truck, and then we'll work on another style. But you know, like this works. Face here, black and white, which I I really want to get into color. I mm-hmm. I was telling him it's been almost ten years since I've done a real full color portrait, and I'm yeah. 
to the point where I just I don't even remember how to do flesh tones anymore. Right. But, but you, you know. like the whole thing, like you're saying the jump rope. Once you yeah. jump into that and you get it back into that, it's going to come quick on there. Have you guys found, I'm going to ask this question for both of you. I'm not trying to take over the pod because I'm going to leave here in a second. Tim, have you found by working and, and just over the years of doing airbrush and everything, have you found something unique that you're like, oh, wow, that's my style of rose or that's my style of this? I noticed when I started tattooing, I would have a certain style of, of way that I did roses. Mm-hmm. People would like, oh, that's cool. Like I can totally tell that's a Brian Kennedy rose. Do you find that you have objects or something personal that you know that yourself that you do? Um, sometimes when I, I do these rolls of money, mm-hmm. you know, certain people are copying them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you know that's your style. You've seen yep. that. No, he, yeah, he copied my, my, oh, just my exact. exact one. No, yeah. yeah, thanks. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but you've learned that you you've definitely built, and I think you learn that as an artist. All of a sudden, when you do something over and over and over, you yeah. get to the point of it, you're like, oh man, I've actually developed my own style. Well, today it's funny. Uh, is it today? Yeah, I think it was today. This dude hit me up in my last bagger, the last one I had. He's like, man, you know, I got some questions for you. I'm trying to paint my bike, and he's like, I really like this bike. I like this, and I was like, dude, just do it. Just do that. Do my paint job. You know what I mean? But I will tell you this. Try to do that and then try to add something to it to make it yours. Yep. Right. You know what I mean? I'm like, you got to understand, like, I'm I'm never going to make another dime off that paint job. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I can't tell you how many times I've seen my paint. The only thing that ever bothered me about someone copying me was when I was nobody. Yeah. And somebody more known in the industry would copy my shit and then my paint job would be on a cover of a magazine mm-hmm. <coughs> Eric Carr and uh, <laughs> you know and then I'm just sitting here like looking at like uh, something that I you know what I mean like that that bothered me but you know what at the, at the same time it was never it was it, it's it. there's nothing I could say nothing I'm gonna do that's gonna change it Unless, it you, just makes unless me, you create your own podcast someday yeah, and you're able yeah, to actually yeah. actually say something about it. I got a call one time years ago, about eight years ago, when I first started doing helmets. And a guy called me. He's like, hey, man, I want this like chemical candy. And it was just the three stripes staggered, how it kind of yeah, comes down the road from there, stuff. right? You know what I'm saying, man. You know exactly mm-hmm. what I'm talking about. And I was like, that okay, I go. AMF shit. I go, AMF shit. Exactly. I go, and that was the big popular thing was the AMF. Everybody wanted the tanks that way. And I told him, I'm like, well, why don't you call Scott and have him do this for you? Oh, it's too much, man. You know, I'm willing to pay you 150 bucks if you can do that for me. I'm like, get the fuck out of here, man. Are you kidding me? Like, first of all, look, man, it's not my style. I'm not doing that. There's no fucking way. You yeah. need to, if you want something that Brian Kennedy is going to do, I'll do it my own way. You know what I mean? Like, give me a break, man. I think that uniqueness, though, and I see a lot of your work, Tim. I think I can definitely now pick you out of a crowd by far. And I think, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm not one to blow smoke, but dude, you're on fire. And I love your airbrush artwork, obviously. Thank you. you, know, you how, how, do you how do you feel about like the lowrider, you know, because I haven't been in it in a while. And so like, what do you think about the whole culture in general? Like, has it like survived very well? You know what I mean? It, it Like I said, I was heavy in it in like 2010, mm-hmm. 11. And then I went full force into bikes, and I've kind of now looked back. So, like, right. how has the industry right. been since? Then? And, and, and I was going to ask you because I'm not so much in the bikes, bikes anymore. Yeah. I'm into low riders now, so it, it's kind of the perfect yeah, question the office, for each yeah. other. But yeah, I think low rider it, it, it's still going strong because there are so many more shows going on in California and throughout the whole South. So you would say that the shows it, it, they totally dictate the customization on the cars. Um. I mean, I, I, I think there's probably like a little bit of truth to it, but then also there is a huge culture, just like bikes have a culture. Right. I think Lowrider has a more respected culture for it. I mean, you don't see a whole lot of fucking weird white kids from the, you know, what, what's the white neighborhood around here? Scottsdale or some shit? <laughs> is that the <laughs> white yeah, neighborhood? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah. Up, <laughs> no, you're not going to see a, a 64 rolling down in Scottsdale. Yeah, right? like... <laughs> But a fucking dude with some like those lawyer, my dad's a lawyer shorts and oh shit. God. It's like it's not it's not something that crosses over. But in the bike world, we have those OGs and this and you know then there's like these lawyers that were riding and and you know for us I'm like I hey dude you ride a bike cool man awesome that you're here hope you experience it but the low rider culture is just fucking like it's a different world man it really yeah. has I mean there's there's drama in it obviously but I mean it's it's a little here and there yeah. So what do you like? How like 
it's it's not crazy like the way it was in um, like in the nineties. Yeah, the nineties like shit was shootings, killing it. shootings yeah, and stuff like, like that. You know, it's it's kind of like when rap music was good when they shot people. And when shit. They, yeah, yeah, when rap <laughs> when music was good. Um, yeah, they don't have the. Uh, Hard body contest stuff. It's more family oriented. Oh yeah, I remember that Lowrider magazine. Right? Fuck yeah, the hard body contest. The hard body contest. You know what? I think you just nailed that too. It's more family oriented. That's, so that's see, what it is. I so, see generations coming down and down and right, down. Right. So it, it opens it up to attracting more people, mm-hmm. you know, families with their Love kids that. and stuff like that. Yeah. So it, it's not as as bad as it was. Um, so it's twenty it's more, years ago. Twenty. Would you say it's it's still like profitable? Like, is it like a viable career for a lot of people though to, to be into the painting or the the hydro? Is it still hydraulics? They they got smart and gone to air ride. <laughs> no, that's a joke. In, yeah, um, low riding. You, you got if you got air ride and, and you're calling it a low rider. They say the dub rider. show. Yeah, right, right, dude. Exactly. When I was sitting there, like, dude, when I was I was working the the first Torres show in L. A. Uh-huh was this the first time they did a lowrider show in LA in like since the 90s and it, they stopped it because people were getting shot and stuff oh, like yeah. that it was a heavy time and I have never seen so many gangster ass women in my life dude so <laughs> we we I was working the door in the back as the cars were coming in yeah and dude there was people that f- had their shit there from Hawaii wow yeah yeah and these chicks and these the dudes were chill but these fucking chicks were like Fuck these cars with their big wheels on them and shit, because they were like traditional lowriders and bombs and all this stuff. And then you had like the dub thing that was going on too with all the big wheels on cars. Right. And so, like the traditional lowrider people was pissed that they're trying to get into a show that had big wheel donks and not really donks, but like right. you know the dub thing. Yeah. And you know on. who pays a lot of homage to that now? I wonder how they felt about this transition. Was the Japanese? The Japanese came in lowriders seemed heavy and hard, yeah. Yeah. and I I love that. I mean, I love how endearing they are and how they how they embrace that culture. Yeah, they see that. and they don't but play around down there. No, they either they, they, they either they're hard. They either forward. pay complete homage to it and do it spec for spec, or they, or they do that times ten with their technology on no, top of it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's what a what a beautiful culture. Have you been to Japan? Yeah, I went in uh, 2015. You did? Nice. Yeah. Okay. Did you go to the, like the like the Moonai show or was we you? went to the Nagoya show? Nagoya show. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. How amazing! That's it was. Awesome. It was crazy. Um, the way they 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 embraced the Hispanic, you know, culture and, and the whole low riding thing there, it was, it was just amazing to see. You know, here we are all the way in Japan. You know, mm-hmm. some of them probably never been to America, but you know, this thing was brought there by you know photography and low rider magazine and stuff like that. You know, oh, and, Esteban be- Oriel. Yeah. Esteban, of course, so, taking all the pictures and. And bringing that yeah. over as well. I was talking to Manny Cicinero recently, and uh, you know Manny. Yes. And um, Manny was telling me that even for them, a lot of the culture of the Japanese, for them to have a friend in America, when you go over there, if you have a friend that is from the states, it's looked as kind of like a hierarchy or like an honor to have somebody from the United States to come over. So I think that's. I mean, how endearing is that? That's awesome. Especially when we dropped so... bombs on them like less than a hundred years ago. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think they got the over the old Hiroshima <laughs> theme was not our generation. So, you know, we yeah. can definitely, yeah. But I think to have that culture, though, it is pretty awesome. I don't see that. I mean, I don't know. We talked about, you know, different cultures and stuff coming up. But, yeah, the Japanese, what they're doing and just to have them. How do you, how do you feel about like the, this awesome. the different, you know, styles of low riding across america from you know like different you know different areas have a different flavor you know what i mean i feel like texas has like a a, a different style it's it's crazy because it really does transition to like chopper building back in the early 60s mm-hmm. and, and 70s where like different parts of the country built different types of bikes because of different types of right riding them yeah. like you yeah. know you in, in cali you would build a bike that could handle corners and they were real narrow to go through the cars you know, in Texas, it's flat and straight. So you right. just build big fucking big, open. long yeah. things that you didn't have to worry about. Do you feel like there's kind of the same kind of style? In- um, no, I, I think the only weirdest thing I seen was when I went to Houston um, last year. A whole bunch and, of swimmers. And we were hanging out with Jose. Yeah. And we seen these extravagant rims with yeah, these. Yeah, like, yeah. Like they call them, uh, fuck what they call them. I'm from Texas. I don't even fucking and, know. 
the slabs are fucking uh i don't know it's fucking ghetto shit though i know that it was crazy looking it was um (laughs) different and unique yeah to that area you know because they don't they didn't have any of that here I didn't see any in California, so and I was yeah. asking Jose, "What the fuck is that?" You know, Jason, let me tell you. I'm gonna stop. And it was gonna, cool. It was different. It was cool. It is weird to see, yeah, different things come up like that. I remember the first time I saw a big wheel bagger, and mm-hmm. I was like, "What the fuck is that front wheel on that bike?" What? Who was the one who originated that? I mean, who came Yaffy. up with those? Yaffe was. Yeah. What was the whole thought process into that? I mean, I'm sure we'll hear in your podcast. You know, we're going to do the podcast with them, and, and I'm sure we'll find out. But, you know, knowing people in the industry. Like, was it more like the donked out style? Like trying no, to it, it's. I think that it was already getting like like the stretch bag thing had been some, some going around since like 03. Oh, of course. Right? So yeah. it was like you see I'm going down, and just naturally when you look at the bikes and you fill the gaps with things, I think it was – it was really just a, it was just a matter of time before somebody like looked at the possibilities of how they can set those things or how they can set it up and then do it. What did you, you know? think of it when you first saw it? Were you like, I thought it was cool as shit. You're like, what yeah. the fuck is yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, something different. It was something unique. at that time. I was so heavy and so interested in paint that the more canvas, the better. Mm-hmm. You know, like you wanted. That's why I like painting sport bikes because I felt like I could get my point across with you know all this this canvas space and right. like I said, I kind of had. The problem that you had, I kind of fixed by just physically taking the bikes in and doing the work on it. But, yeah. you know, when the bagger thing came around, it was just, uh, it was enticing because for me working on sport bikes, I thought that jumping into baggers, I was going to get that Harley money we always thought we saw on TV. Right. You know, so mm-hmm. you're like, all right, I'll do this one for two grand. Yep. You know, but if I get this one, it looks good, then I'm going to be able to get 10 on the next one, you know, and it just, <laughs> it up. never really happened because the, 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 the world in that chopper thing, you know, the, the guys that paid that kind of money for those bikes, mm-hmm. they weren't really into bikes. You know what I mean? They were, they were buying, like I said before, it's corporate. it was a material thing. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. They didn't, they didn't really yeah. appreciate owning a West coast chopper or, uh, you know, something that Eddie Trotter, any of these like, Known people, they never appreciate. It's like it. having a Prada bag or it something was, like. You know, well, they, just a they trailered it everywhere. So. Trailer queens, yeah, like, exactly. Even if they, even if they really did buy his art and they did trailer it, mm-hmm. that's I, I could respect that. But yeah. it, it really boils down to it. Now we have people who are literally trading original West Coast fucking choppers parts at ungodly amounts of money because they're not around anymore. Right. You know, and they're worth a lot of money. So there, there's some kind of art form now. There's this, there's this thing about them that people are willing to, you know, trade a bike for some mid controls on some aspects. You know what I mean? It's crazy. You know, and um, I think that for any, I think one thing that we as artists kind of might, we, we we've been kind of talking about it, me and you, but I think that some of us are really looking for a way to really feel like we're artists and not just, you know creating the next part of the next you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. i keep saying like for you can tell when someone appreciates what you're doing like they're buying art from you as opposed to like you're the next part they need on their project right you know like your artwork is just as important as the upholstery work that they also got or yeah you know what i mean yeah i know exactly yeah that's very well said it's the same thing when we saw the the tires starting to get big the 200 the 280s the 300 at first, everything was like, whoa, what the heck is this? It's something new and big and different. In the low riding scene, have you seen different things or do you have ideas that are going to be like game changers? Do you see cars that came out? Even last year, like, I'll just pinpoint on this. Did you see something last year at a show or something else you were like, what the fuck? Like, who did that? Or like, how is that? Or like, I know you've been to a ton of different shows and I know you're in the mix of the low riding mm-hmm. scene. Are you seeing an artist or certain thing come out differently that you're like starting to attract to that you'll see that maybe is the next wave or start. No, I haven't seen anything lately. And what I mean by that is just like even something that could be artistically too. I mean, as simple as like, you know, a pattern or a certain type of a way of doing stuff. We see in the motorcycle world that people, when they paint stuff, we were talking about Austin Poland. Mm. Who's doing a lot of this more of a race type of a style. Mm-hmm. And now we're starting to see that, which is like, okay, cool. This is the next thing. More of the pearls versus the flakes. Right. You know, t- tending to go in that direction. I wasn't sure if the low rider had some different changes yeah. into it or whatnot. You know what? I, you remember when, like, uh, Mike Lamberson, is that his name? Like, Dragon Lines, 
something like that. He started, he's one of those dudes that got the Swift cars really popping back in like 2008, 2007 with all the leaf everywhere. Like this, I want to say it's Mike Lamberson or something like that. And uh, he made it to where like all these people were doing these bets, like Loki does it a lot, you know, like uh-huh. a nice little leaf design down the side and then some like free floating stripes that kind of go right. through it. Like, I feel like that had a, a, a stronghold in a while in the scene. I just, is it more that nowadays or is it back towards like full panels and and think, uh, and yeah. patterns everywhere and shit? I think it's, with that, it might be territorial. Mm. I mean, because here we have bugs. In California, there's Danny D and, and Candy, Candy and Chrome in California as well. And everybody, um, you know, the little painters throughout the you know mm-hmm. southwest they were copying candy and chrome style because they felt that that was the easiest way they could do it to mm-hmm. achieve a low rider look but dude you know what you, you ever heard of jb customs out of dallas mm-hmm. he's like one of the ogs of the dallas scene uh-huh. and he's had a paint shop forever and like his style of graphics is kind of it's a lot of pearl fades everywhere like uh-huh. overlapping overlapping and um, he would kind of like what you're saying like he would do he had a style and then he would have people come work for him painters and he would come in and do the artwork but it was his shop right Right. and then that painter would quit and go work here and now this shop's doing customs and his style right is there and then, yeah there was like fucking right. eight it, painters style yeah, it, travels yeah, yeah. It, it just breeds more styles yeah, yeah. Or people who are copying that style. You know, and I, I like this. I, I, I try to encourage people this. Like, look, there's nothing, in my opinion, you don't. You guys don't have to agree, but I don't think there's anything wrong with if you like what I do to be inspired by it, but try to make it yours. Correct. You know what I mean? I like, think that's yeah, yeah. huge. Yeah. I think, yeah, and that's what we touched on. Like, even the guy that wanted me to do this Scott Chemical Candy thing, damn, yeah, you can't do that I, I don't like when people like take such a simple design like that though yeah. like think about it it's an AMF paint job right. and you just I love Scott to death but I mean I, I know how Scott is and he's not tripping on it but like yeah. you can't be like hey man you stole my flame job like come on no. get yeah. the fuck out yeah. of here that's a hard one <laughs> yeah that's very much that way or people that say that too about like scallops or tape fades or whatnot. like oh this guy bit on my style or whatnot. like if you did the exact same job and I've seen that over the years with Paint Huffer, I've seen I'm people. Guilty of that one myself. You're guilty? Oh yeah, of- I almost got a cease and desist from Coop. I was doing devil heads left and right. I kid you not, and I literally got a letter. Stop from it. him? Yeah, and this is when I was learning. That's why you frame it, Whoa. dude. This <laughs> is frame it. Sounded cool. <laughs> yeah, I did. I kept I'm it. Kidding. But you know, as, as you're learning, yeah. you want to learn. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I want to do pinups just like Tim. You know. Sure, sure. I, I, I want to get it shit. where people yeah. are like, "Who did that?" You know. That I just want to meet the chicks that you're doing them for. Like, you get the oh, they're all Franken. Fuck, they're all Frankenstein I'm just girls. Kidding. I'm just joking. I'm gonna get her tits. <laughs> exactly. Her exactly. Yeah, I'm like, exactly. Damn, dude. Exactly. Like her hair. Tim's got great models. Tell them that that's exactly what you do. As far as you take a head here and yep, a, yep. you have to because yeah. uh, a couple times I did post, you know, who the model was, tagged her and everything. And one time, she uh, she. Wrote on there, this is not me. Take this down, or I'll have you deleted. And I really? Was like, I was like, "Fuck, what a bitch!" Dude. Man. I'm like, whatever, whatever. I took it down. We have now. I don't, I don't even tag the models anymore. Yeah, yeah. We have poor like Christy Mack had put a like on one of our pictures. Some guy in the back east. He's part of Team Paint Effort. He's phenomenal. And he I remember did, that paint. paint. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. And she put a like on it and said hi and everything. I was like. That's cool. Fuck, dude. That's crazy. It's kind of fuck, dude. Yeah, I'm like, hell yeah, right on. Thank you, Chrissy. Appreciate it. But no, that's nice to get acknowledgement. At least she saw it. Yeah. She was, you know, no, at least, yeah, at least she liked it. At least she liked it. Or said, you know, I'm going to get a court order, yeah, dude. Yeah, court order. Dude. Come yeah. on. You should be honored at that point. Right, just to right. Be, like, give me a break. And, and well, that's the thing is a lot of these lowrider models, mm-hmm. they love it. Yeah. Dude. They love it. And, and those are the women or the models that I like. What They're a great cool with it. society. Yeah. I've never seen more of a society where I think we know that is family. Everything right. about family. When we go to an event, like you and I were at the event back in June, July, mm-hmm. and family, 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 all these families coming together, hey, what's up, man, hey, what's up, how are you? This is my wife, this is my son, this is ever. I think those pass downs yeah. will keep the art going. Yeah. You know, and I see, hope it does. I don't know if that's happening in, in um, hot rodding. No. Well, dude, you know, dude. Yeah. So, how many twenty-year-olds do you know have a hot rod? Yeah, the it's, not, it's not like it was, I man. Because back in the '60s well, and the '70s, it was so much more tangible. Nowadays, you can't. Do well, that. so that's the thing. That group of people 
are the same group now. They just got old and that's it. You know what I mean? They didn't really pass it on. That's what happens in low writing. It it gets passed on from this generation to the next and it still keeps going strong. Yeah. Um, well, I think with the the you know the in the correlation to hot rodding, I mean, hot rodding, you have to be from that era to respect and appreciate the primitive technology in those cars, right? You know, so you know you take a low rider and it has a curb appeal that's just like it's part of culture. It's been a part of music. It's been part of so much of culture for the last thirty years. And then hot rodding has been an old man's game. Exactly. You know, so yeah. then you get like. You know, you got your, you know, Gas Monkey and, and um, you know, Richard Rollins. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that looks like a, now it's an old man, rich man's game. You know what I mean? Then you look at some of the prices of these cars and how to get those. And it's like. It's a Barry Jackson. You know, yeah. and you, you can take a fucking, you know, Impala or you can still get Impalas fairly cheap. Maybe not a 59 or 58, but right. you can get you a 64 for about 40 grand or, or a little bit less and do the work into it. But, you know, fuck, man, like. You do a resto mod. I mean, you're looking at 150, 200 grand into yeah. a car spending, for a solid color or some shit. Five years to build it. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, that's why I like bikes, man. I can have like three in a year. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I don't know, man. I, I got a fucking mouthful of cookie. Right so now. we're Tim. What do you see? What's What's next for you, bud? I mean, I know you got. We were talking about SEMA, and you got some stuff coming up with that. What do you have right now that you're hyped on, that you're working on, that you're excited um, about? Nothing big this month, next month, though. Mm-hmm. That's a big month. Um, I'm doing uh, some old school wood grain on a boat. Nice. I haven't done wood grain in, I would say, four years. So when you do that, is that gel coated over, or is how does you um, get to apply that differently? Or? Well, this is a really old boat that the mm-hmm. guy had since. 70s or okay. whatever so they had this like printed like wood grain laminate stuff that's mm-hmm. just got old color fading it's just cracking and peeling off so he had a painter sand it all down reprimer and, and gel coat it and then just paint it whatever color that i needed for the base clear coat it and sand it down for me so, so all i have to, to do is just yeah Graphics. just put the put the uh, wood grain in and walk away that's it that's rad it's kind of like uh back in the day of doing real fire <sighs> man i miss that shit I bring it up all the time, like yeah, yeah bring you it do back. talk about that. You should, yeah, bring it back, man. I remember getting well, the DVDs of uh, of Michael his Valley. Michael Valley and yeah. Dude, you know, True Flame. Man, yeah. just the money that I made for just the little amount of effort that it took to do Real Fire. Yeah, just like now, was it hard to learn that process? It seems like you have to have some type of because you're kind of working. It depends on if you're starting airbrushing at the time or if you're right. already a, a like. I've always liked to classify there's there's two type of artists in my opinion. You got your mm-hmm. your t-shirt background, your illustration background. Okay. And you can always tell the difference because one has control. Mm-hmm. T-shirt guys, they got control. Mm-hmm. They have smoothness and, and fluid fluidity to their work. Right. And then the structural guy or a, a illustrator what, illustrator mm-hmm. yeah. is much less control of the airbrush and they're much more shorter strokes, much more structured. Well, let me ask you this: When you do a true fire like that, are you are you boxing in? Let, let's say we have a, a black background, right? Mm-hmm. Are you doing lights to darks? What I mean by that is, are you doing like like your whites? Actually, you do darks like, to lights because the the re, because if you're doing this traditional way with the candies, mm-hmm. then you need to put those darkest candies on the bottom. So yeah. you're gonna do like your oranges, your reds, your, okay. your red, ones, orange, part, gold, white. And then yeah. Bring it Actually, I think if you want to do the traditional way, you do some purple, then the red, then this and that. Yeah, because you're building the true flame. But, you know, realistically, I mean, the great thing about it, though, is like so many people have took real fire mm-hmm. and turned it into so many things, like this like electrical current. Have you seen Steve's fire? Which one? Steve? Steve Wisniewski? Was Steve it? is, uh, I know Steve. You know um, what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know exactly what you're What's talking the shot? about. It is, um, oh, shit, I know it's going to kill me here. Uh, his fire is phenomenal. Fucking insane. Yeah, absolutely. Royal Rain? Insane. What is it? Royal Rain? Or something? It, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it is Royal Rain. Rain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is Royal Rain. He's got some amazing fire. Uh, the last time I seen anybody do really nice fire was Patrick Guyton. I don't know. Where did he co- go? You know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's all he knew how to do. I don't know. <laughs> he's, <laughs> right? he's, he's a truck faded driver. Out, he faded yeah. out, yeah. He's a truck driver now. Probably. No, that's but that's crazy. Though. But even though, like... You, go, you think about that, like, how did Mike 
come up with that process or how did the guy come up with the process of doing the you know taking a water bottle and squirting it and doing water droplets it's just those different anomalies in our industry that we talked about where you have water droplets you have the fat tire you have uh, Paul Yaffe doing the big wheel those are the different things that are definitely game changers I mean you can go out and like do like the low rider we talked about that a little bit ago where you had the wheels that are looking kind of retarded you know I mean, well yeah it wasn't really a low rider it was just they were just in, looking for a car show to put their shit in yeah right yeah. yeah so it's like what's the next it'll be cool to see over the next 10 years five years what's next the one that thing I that I, I don't like and I never even bat an eye and this might be bad for like progression is that every time some kind of fancy gimmick paint comes out or mm-hmm. the new chrome paint comes out everybody's like oh did you get that new chrome paint you got that new also corp fucking you know this that like dude I'm you see that new thing on YouTube where you press a button it changes the color of the car like all that shit dude like <laughs> or the glow in the dark we have now the uh, luminance uh, yeah. yeah or the glow in the dark paint or the, uh, well, the just, iridium and just all that stuff I mean like the gimmick stuff if, if you're I think that that's what people that aren't talented do like oh I'm gonna find something else to be the shining knight in armor in my paint job instead of just put together some talent and skill you know what I mean? And bring it to fruition. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I, you see that shit come and go like fucking plastic dick came out and everybody, th- I, s- I said plastic dick. Or, plastic dip. Okay. You said plastic dick. That's <laughs> plastic, cool. <laughs> plastic <laughs> dip. You know, like all that shit. I mean, it's kind of, I, I, I guess it's fun to watch, but you know, right. I just don't, um, I don't like the whole gimmick stuff. You know, I never was into it, you know. Um, we, I think I was talking to someone recently about something. They were trying to sell me on some shit like that. Like, oh, it's going to be the next thing. Uh, oh, that fucking Luminor, Luminor thing or whatever. Yeah, so it's talking about, yeah, the stuff that, like, I think it's cool. That, yeah. I think it's cool. You know what I mean? It's got its right. point. Like, right. I, I want to say Yaffe's done a couple things on his bikes, with lighting up logos, but not my thing, not dude. Not mine either. No, you know? I mean, and, and I signed up for that too. I just think it's, I think it's, I think it's cool when that happens when it's not when it's just a mistake and you find this great mistake and then it comes up into our industry and it builds something amazing and awesome whether it's your artwork or the way that you do something and it just it, through fruition it happens it's awesome that way but yeah I don't know it'll be interesting to see where we're going to go next and and take off from there how did you make the transition into low riding. Were you into low riders from way back? Did you have yeah. low riders? I don't have a low rider. Never okay. had one, yeah. I know, like, me neither. Like Everybody asked me too. They're like, hey, paint offer, you don't have a low rider? You don't have a car right. that you flaked out yeah. or whatever? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I, I do, but not, you know. Yeah. It's the same as when I was working for all these bike shops. People are saying, you know, what do you ride? Oh, I don't ride. Yeah, that's fucking crazy, man. Not around <laughs> here. Yeah. You'll get squished. Right. You know? <laughs> I have. So yeah. with low riding, it was just like what I said earlier. It was something that I loved the artwork when I was a kid going to the shows and stuff. And I always had my eye on it when I was at the bike shop working there, doing all the skulls, the eagles, and, and whatnot. But and I always wanted to do a lowrider piece. So when I got my first job, you know, I did it like super cheap, did it really, really fast, you know. But it got the attention of all these other guys in the community because it's a really tight yeah community. Let me ask you that too. A lot yeah. of a lot of even artists like that were tattoo artists. I used to do a lot of stuff for free. What I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it through my Monday through Friday. What I would do is I would tell somebody to come in on a Sunday. I said, "Yeah, come in on a Sunday. Let me do this badass portrait on you. I'm gonna do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. But let me do it. If you if you sign up for it, it's free. I mean, I'll, if you it's always hard. Hours. It's always hard as a painter mm-hmm. to do because. But it was just to build up my portfolio. A tattoo, a tattoo thing, like, you know, I get it. But material costs, minimum. Time, minimum compared oh, to like totally. a totally. You're right. You know? I mean, we even talk about that too. Like, you know, I've had my shop for 14 years. But never in your life will you take something that costs you 40 cents and make $40. I mean, that's a huge profit margin, right? right? I'm talking about like a piercing. If you buy a, yeah, yeah. a piece of jewelry and whatever, the total cost is maybe 40 cents. Mm-hmm. You turn it around, you're making $40. That's a huge markup. And you're right. In the painting world, that would be through the fucking roof. I mean, to build your portfolio, you're talking 10 k That's why it sucks whenever I, I do things, you know, this podcast with people and like, like, hey, man, no pun intended for like Dixon hooking me up today, but... When they're like, hey, man, uh, I want you to paint a bike, and but hey, man, have all these shirts and all this free shit. You know, it's it's appreciated, but, you know, 
if I sold parts for a living and I gave those parts away or whatever, then I'm, I'm really not giving away much more than just the profit margin right. as opposed to giving away labor and time is much more, it's harder. You know what I mean? And uh, that's kind of what gets me about the whole SEMA thing all the time. Like I'm not interested in, in giving away a week's worth of my work yeah. f- for the, <laughs> you're already I was talking about earlier. You're, you're at SEMA and you're airbrushing and some dude comes up and goes, hey, man, that skull is the best one I've ever seen, man. Uh, I'm a millionaire. <laughs> I don't know if you know this. And uh, I just want to, like, just p- buy all kinds of shit for you and, and like, get you to be my painter. Right. It never fucking happens. Never going to happen. You know? It what you happens. are <laughs> is you're just, in a sense, whoring yourself out for that company. And I think that they're going off and they're for thinking, the idea. thinking that we're, the- we're, we're going to give you all this exposure. We're going to make you famous. And they don't realize... It's some corporate person who's so far disconnected from from our industry. Mm-hmm. You know, so far disconnected. I used to go to like the tourist shows and stuff, yeah. and I would always set up and I would do canvases there. And I, we talked about this in the first podcast. So I would do these canvases of like famous people, like Ice Cube and Rihanna and fucking all these other people that people would recognize when they're walking by. Didn't you do something for Cube? You actually well, did I didn't something. do it for him. I did it for Torres oh, okay. when he was an artist they paid to come gotcha. to a show. Okay. So doing all that stuff, it was like when these people are walking by and they see that recognizable face that you're doing at a show, it fucking like draws people over there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But when you do the SEMA thing and you're doing it for these companies, then you can't do anything with copyright infringement stuff on there. Right. You know what I mean? So, so it's like... Doing, by you doing a Jace Hudson Skull... Yeah. You're not going to, yeah, exactly. I mean, I can't do something that, like like I said, you're playing, you're gimmicking yourself a little bit where you're trying to, like, play to the audience. Like, all right, man, there's a whole bunch of old white dudes here. Fuck it, I'm going to do, uh, let's do some Dukes of Hazard or some shit like that. You know what I mean? Like, you try to, like, do something that the audience, the people walking by is going to catch your eye and get your attention. Definitely. And, I mean, that's how I got in fucking lowrider art. You know what I mean? Doing fucking canvases at a, at a show, at a lowrider show. Yeah. yeah. And, um you know, but like it, this was also in 2010 when, like I said many times on this podcast, we didn't use social media for marketing like we do now. It oh, was no. all about getting ass uh, yeah, on social exactly. media back in the day. <laughs> right. You know? Exactly. So yeah. now that this world is much different and we've all <clears throat> spent the last, you know, we started in MySpace and that graduated to the early days of Facebook and it taught us how to market ourselves and become better advertisers. You know? And every yeah. day you're running a commercial yeah. and you're running a. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah, absolutely. You have I mean, think to. about it, man. Like, ever since the early 2000s, you've been filling out profiles and trying to do about me's and all these different platforms, whether it was dating sites or this. You just, it's like this conditioning thing that's like you're, you're selling yourself, yeah. you know? Yeah. And you're finding the more, you're trying to, like, especially if you're on a dating app, you're trying to find words to describe you the most the best and you only get like eight pictures or three or six pictures to put up to like let the world know why you're the best guy they should bang you know what i mean absolutely <laughs> it's a, it's all like this like thing that's kind of like bell rolled and now it's 2000 fucking uh, 19 and you know we're all influencers now <laughs> there was a saying like i think somebody said years ago that kind of stuck with it is that you should work so hard to where you never have to introduce yourself ever again to anybody and i think that's very Awesome in a sense. I mean, I don't want to be famous, and I don't give a shit about that. I could care less about that, actually. Um, I do have to pay the bills, and I know that is very. I mean, we all do every day. Got to pay the bills. Sun's up. I got to work hard. But I think if we build something and build a brand, and build an art or a piece of artwork, something that is all that somebody can relate to, I love that idea where people come up and be like, "Oh my God, you're Tim Lowry." And you didn't even introduce yourself. You didn't say hi. You didn't say anything at all. Right. I saw you because I knew who you were, and you came over, and I was like, "Dude, I know you." Yeah. That's awesome. That's a cool feeling. Yeah. Um, you've worked that hard. And sometimes, it, it, for me, it creeps me out. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine when, when, when I mean, people yeah. know yeah. more about me than I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it creeps that's me yeah. Out. That's Dude, gonna be a little bit. Yeah. was yeah. the shit. <laughs> that's I, I. I don't post pictures of myself. Your house yeah. looks great. Yeah. Your yeah, exactly. Home address. Oh, yeah, exactly. hey, yeah. is that your uh, yeah, is that real your address pick? right there? Okay, <laughs> we'll see you tonight. <laughs> So, so what right. do you think, uh, you know, moving forward with, like, what you're doing? I mean, do you have, like, a goal that you want to reach within, like, the painting and the lowriders? Or is it kind of like just a, I mean, what's what's the what's the future that you want out of all this artwork and stuff? Um, 
I've always been attracted to, you know, fine art. Yeah. Regardless, you know, it's, you know, I want to get, because all this stuff that we do, it's all commercial. Mm -hmm. I mean, the bikes, the cars, it's, it's all commercial. So with getting into fine art, I, I've always wanted to do like oil paintings and stuff like that. I wanted to do surrealism type. Yeah. And that's the subject matter that I really was drawn to mm -hmm. and still am. And that's what I really, really want to do. Instead of, you know, loading my guns with all this urethane and then, you know, just sniffing it all day long. Yeah. You know, it, it's going to take its toll someday. So. Yeah, I worry about that a lot, too. I, I actually think about that quite a bit. Just the, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm 37 now uh, this weekend. And it's like, fuck, man. Like, I've been huffing paint for fucking Absolutely. shit tw since 21. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was you know? buying so much paint and painting so much that's how i got the nickname i had called a local jobber and they were like are you coming over tomorrow to shoplift or a huff paint and then it was like hey paint huffers here paint huffers here you know <laughs> that's how it got into play from there but you think about the health aspects of it dude i think you're right as far as doing fine art i've seen a lot of painters yeah. there's um phil leonard's uh, serrarium and he's starting to do art shows and stuff like that do you see yourself doing maybe an art show or a gallery yeah, I definitely want to do that. Yeah, how cool would that be? Yeah. So you definitely. you've been doing a lot of digital art too, like that kind of thing. is that more to help you with composition for the actual artwork that you're putting on the. Um, when it comes to digital artwork, um, say if I have this great idea, you know, like a, a bandita chick or whatever, yeah, I'll flesh that out digitally because oh. it can translate better on like a shirt or a sticker or a print or whatever, and and that's why I do that. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't take, say, if I painted a picture on, like, on a, a canvas or whatever, I wouldn't yeah. take a picture of that and try to sell that as a print. That's the only thing I do with digital as far as rendering mm -hmm. is it, it's really rough. You know, it's just a rendering, just to show the customer the idea of yeah. where I'm going. And then that's pretty much that. I really don't try to spend a whole lot of time on the computer. Mm. Are you doing a lot of things on iPad now, or are you just strict on the computer still? Just still on the computer, oh, dude. Yeah. yeah everybody's you got like a Wacom pad or something? Huh? You got yeah. a pad or anything? Yeah, okay. I have a, a, a Wacom, yeah. Yeah. Fuck, man, I, I ended up getting an iPad Pro a couple months ago, and I've been using it to... Uh, so, like, I'll take a picture of a helmet from a few different angles, and then mm -hmm. I'll just trace the outline of the helmet. Yeah. Then save it, and then, it, you know, I can, like, sketch on there, or I can just send it tra straight to a printer and uh print out like the outlines of helmets from four different angles i've had to start doing different angles because i've only been doing side shots yeah so i would always focus all the energy of the design on the side because that's the only place i drew right and then right. have to kind of like make up the center yeah. so now i've been trying to focus on the center and work to the sides gotcha. to kind of get different styles of flow and things like that you know yeah. so did you ever really get much into doing graphics or was it all like you just kind of stick more with the uh i I started getting more into graphics as soon as I was at uh, at Spooky Fest, mm -hmm. yeah, and then a lot more when we went over to um, Steel Vision, mm -hmm. and it was just a lot of graphics. Which, if you have too much graphics, you know, you could just really muddy it all up. You know, I, I find it better for a, a balance of graphics and artwork all in yeah. one. You know Agreed, hundred percent. I mean? yeah. yeah, I think there's a you know, one thing that we were kind of getting at it earlier, but I kind of forgot, but like the style of airbrush you do on like the lowriders, like the reason why I dig it is because it doesn't overpower anything. You know, you can have this elaborate mural on a hood and, it, you know, you really can't see it from across the fucking parking lot. But right. as you get closer, this this detail builds out. Yeah. You know, and that's one thing I've always in, like tried to do with my, my work. And that's kind of why I've always stuck with like monochromatic stuff because... Mm -hmm. You know, if you got like a, a colored paint scheme on a helmet and then you got a full flesh and tone, you know, face on the top of it, that flesh tone stands out way yeah. more than, yeah. than yeah. the other ones do. So, yeah, I mean, that, with the low riders, you rarely, I rarely ever get to do color. Mm. And when I do, you know, I'm excited, you know, yeah. just like what you said earlier, I'm like, holy shit, I forgot how to do flesh tones. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's been God, probably about six months or oh, seven fuck, months. Dude. But right now I'm working on a lowrider bike part and the face is smaller than my thumbnail. That's another thing that I fucking forgot how to do is small faces. Yeah. You know, like working tighter things. It's it's kind of like 
I I force myself to do the helmets in a way that I know I can knock them out of the park each time. Mm -hmm. I put the faces at a size that's super comfortable. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And now it's like I've I'm out of practice with all the other ways of doing it. Like I haven't done like, a, like a, a collage of stuff in a long. You know how like back in especially in the baggers and shit you do you know a face and then skulls and then roses and like all these different filler things everywhere and you had yeah. this like whole top side covered in airbrush yeah. i haven't done anything like that in years dude yeah and it's it's kind of like I, i've been wanting to jump back into it and bring it into the helmets and kind of like bring some of the older style stuff that i haven't done in a while into right. it right. and and try to make it new again and make it fun and yeah more than anything just make it a new type of piece that people can get from us through our helmets and whatnot so yeah and that's one of the biggest reasons why I jumped into the helmet stuff is just, uh, I mean, you know this, like when you, it's kind of like with a hood mural, like you know exactly how, like how big your canvas is and that's it. Mm -hmm. When you're on a bagger, it's like, how many more parts do you have to yeah, go? Yeah, you, you, know? you just keep going and going yeah. and going, you know. And then you got to fight, and, and then you you go out of the, you know, like you just get to a point where you, uh you have to stop and you could make it cooler but you have to stop because you have to put it on all these other parts too mm -hmm. and it's just a it's a horrible place to be as an artist man right you know where you have to stop yourself from doing badass shit because of <laughs> the extra stuff that's gonna take so yeah yeah it's fucking crazy so what do you um have you even tried to get into the oil painting much anymore to understand the whole I know uh Steve Gibson is into that shit hardcore yeah yeah he's um I used to oil paint when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. You know, my daddy bought me the whole oil paint set and stuff like that. So it's a different I was type of smelling patience, turpentine right? back then. You know, I, was yeah. like, I, I guess I like the chemicals. So yeah, <laughs> dude, that oil painting shit, man. When I, I never tried it. I, I looked into it once, and then I, the, the how, time like it's a process over time. Yeah. To build it, you know, yeah, to yeah. build out the piece, and I was like, fuck, man, I don't have that kind of attention man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we're airbrush artists. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Dude, if I can make myself take longer than two hours to do a face on a on a helmet, then or two or three hours, whatever the case may be, like yeah. I'm interested to see what I could do with time. But I start seeing the finished product, and I'm like, "Fuck, I want to get there. I want to see it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I want to I want to experience this already. You know, and yeah, when I could have took more time, like that's one of my my biggest fucking yeah. problems. Do you ever feel like sometimes when you start a project, like like it's going south or it's looking like total shit and you're like and you stop in the middle and you're like what the fuck am i doing but you snap out of it and you're like okay i just gotta I have confidence and just keep going and yeah. it's gonna start looking It'll better look does that ever happen to you yeah Food and <laughs> all the time right <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh yeah it definitely happens man I, it's kind of like what you were saying about like when you would go too hard on a color or on like a shade or something it's like yeah. fuck man like that's one thing I don't really have control over is the is the hue or the um, the the uh, percentage of the tone when I do mm -hmm. like the black and white portraits. It's kind of yeah. like just whatever ends up being. It might be super white, super muted. Just kind of depends, right? You right. know. But I've been I've been going so much into the detail of things that I really miss doing things that look like they're airbrushed. You know, like the softness and the uh, you know the airbrush. There's a reason why they there's an airbrush tool in Photoshop. It's a look that it does. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, and we've been kind of doing the opposite over the last couple of years in some parts of the industry when it comes to airbrushing. Mm -hmm. We've been trying to make it look textured and detailed and oil painted almost, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I don't know, man. <laughs> well, Steve's got it down, man. He's his stuff looks like it's actually painted by brush and stuff yeah. like that. It's crazy. Yeah. I was just going to ask, does he actually use brush? Like, does he mix no. media? No, I, I took his brush. class um, last year. It's just, you know, how you lay the paint down. Yeah. That's crazy. He's got high high air pressure. You know, it's just, just cool. Lots of make, flood lines, make, basically. Make it look like like it's painted, yeah. you know? Yeah. A lot of cross-hatching, I think, is what yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. So what what do you think about, uh, you know, like like you said, you're, you're an accomplished airbrush artist and you're taking classes. Like, yeah. how does that... How does that fuck like? Because I think that you're a master at the way you airbrush. Mm -hmm. But then I saw you just took Ryan's class too yeah. recently. Yeah. Like, what are you looking to find when you do this? Just new ways to approach it? Um, or? I I just like learning new things yeah. all the time from you know as many artists as I can. You know, you can never stop learning. That's the thing with art, yeah. and especially with this in 
industry with so many things coming in and out, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to learn something else. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Would I take that approach to a low rider thing? Probably not, but I could probably take that to maybe a bike, mm -hmm. you know, and charge I guess, for that. I guess if you, like you were saying, you're going to do that boat and things, I guess for me, like I just turn cars down, like low riders, trucks. I just don't do it. And it's kind of more of a stupid reason. I just, I'm booked for three months doing this and mm -hmm. my days off are already planned. I don't yeah. want to add, yeah, yeah. add stress to it. And, and uh, sometimes I, I look at a truck, I'm like, fuck, man, I'd love to lay some graphics out or do something on this. But then, you it's know. Just, it's too laborious. It's just off the beaten path, man. Like yeah. I, It's kind of like I'm conditioned to pull out another helmet and knock it out of the park each time. Right. You know, I'm so used to doing it that, like, when you throw that, that different shape in the mix and trying to fucking put graphics or artwork to it, it kind of, like, throws you off the balance. Off. It's probably a good thing. You know, but it just kind of throws you off of your like, fuck, man, I've been looking at this canvas for so long now, and now this new one's here, and I have to almost relearn how to do this shit. So, yeah, yeah. We're over here just looking. I just got another customer asking for free shit. Hey, can you send me free <laughs> flake and tape? I will hook you up. It would be greatly appreciated, and I will use it in a positive way. If not, I totally understand. Thank you for your time. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love you. Thank you. This yeah. guy has 51 followers. That's nice. 51. Thank you, Mr. 50. And all tumblers. He's doing tumblers. Nice. That's good. Oh, man. Thank you, Mario. I, I started paying trash cans when I started. You know, we all start. <laughs> but, but let me turn this into something else that's cool, though. Tim, have you found, and as myself, I mean, product developer, when you use a lot of urethanes in your airbrushing, yeah. have you found or developed like maybe a color palette? Would would you ever want to have like a Tim Lowry signature series or do something like that? I could, you know, um, when I do my colors, uh, especially on the pinups, people are always asking me, do I get, you know, this Craig Frazier, whatever flesh tone or whatever flesh tone that's out, that's mm -hmm. pre-mixed and stuff. I say, no, I mix them on the fly right there. Nice. Because if you're buying this pack, you know, you can't mix it towards a light complected. You know what I mean? Or a darker complexion. It just comes as is, and you're yeah. going to have to adjust that pack. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing my color tones and fleshes, I know what color target area I'm going for exactly. Nice. Mm. So I like that. So if, so if somebody asks me, you know, yeah, I could produce like 20 different color palettes of flesh tone. Mm -hmm. So Easily, because... It, probably even more than 20 too I mean it'd probably be a better so thing just to yeah. sell like a little color wheel to get to those colors yeah. like oh a little what? brown this and this and you reach this flesh tone and you know the funny Jeez, thing you is talk about that too that's a great thing to touch on I think a lot of artists and a lot of painters that are out there and I know Tim knows how to use a color wheel and I know you do as well mm -hmm. but a lot of artists don't know how to use a color wheel what are right. complementary secondary tertiary colors right I think they all fall off on that it's kind of a um I don't know. I think it's a crucial thing to know your color tones. It also depends on when you come into this this paint world. I mean, like, obviously, us, we all kind of came in in the same era. I mean, you were doing it back in the 80s and stuff. But, I mean, you really went gung-ho on it in the early 2000s. And it's yeah. like, I think you become a product of, like, what's popular then. And, you know, I think that... Uh, since I wasn't much of a biker in that, that time frame, I was trying to be an artist. So... <laughs> I focused on shadows and things like that that I didn't have the skill to apply, but I, I learned it. And then once I started to get that 10,000 hours of work and, and skill behind it, then you're like, fuck, man, I remember learning about these fucking things back in the day and color tones and yeah. and shit like that. So it kind of plays into, into a little bit, I think. I have another question, though. When you do, Jace, for your examples, when you do the portraits, do you do a white base and then do the old trick, like where you would take a pencil on the back of like a face. And is that how you make your stencils? And no, you can actually do the. Actually, I, I've learned it a couple ways. So Ryan does it one way. I don't want to give you your tricks mm -hmm. away. No, I mean, yeah, I mean fuck, dude. I mean, industry knowledge now. No, it's it's Shh. it's all it put it like this. You can teach. I can teach five hundred or five people how to do it. One out of the five will figure it out. Right, I get to exactly. them everything. You know what I mean? There's so right. many things that come into play right. for you know having the knowledge and having. This the is also for Tim as well. I didn't know if you make any stencils, pre stencils, or do you do everything um, on the fly, or is it more? Mine's just a cut and blow method. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that the best. Yeah. I like that way because it's cleaner. Yep. Yeah. You know, but 
when you're doing all these super fine details, it's hard to get the fine details when you're cutting them out. Like Corey St. Clair is really good at it, but yeah. if you ever see one of his cutout templates, it like you're like what the fuck? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looks like, it looks it looks like, like a shredder. lace. It looks like a lace fucking painting yeah. or something. Oh, but wow. but um, the other thing is kind of what we were talking about earlier. It's a it's a for me, I've had to paint in so many weird places in my life that you you become the MacGyver of transferring images or mm-hmm. or measuring and all these other things. So like I know you know the old school way. You know when you're a kid and you're like learning how to draw, but you're not good at drawing, but you want to press your buddies. Yes. So you learn the trace method of like tra- let me let me color it on this side and then flip it over and trace it back, and it's gonna mm-hmm. leave an imprint. And then I'll just come in and do the shading and tell them I drew it. Yeah. You know it's that kind of thing. And so you can actually take some. Uh, like some 4B or something on the back of a piece of paper, put your image down, just outline it, and then that that graphite will, will transfer. Yes. Yeah. It's hard to see, especially over black, but... That's, that's the way that I would always do it. Yeah. Like when I would do like a chopper tank, if I was going to do whatever X thing on there, I would hit it with a white base. See, I used to do it with Sorrel paper, but Sorrel, that shit's so harsh. So harsh, yeah, exactly. You, 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 it's hard to like get rid of it. And you have to right. use the right Sorrel paper yeah. too because a lot of people would use See, like, like his stuff is so soft on those low riders mm-hmm. that if you're doing a fucking charcoal pretty much transfer that's what I'm asking. It's not, it's it's not, not going to work. You I, know? I never right. use pencil when it comes to that. Yeah. And one method I do use is it is the cut and blow but when I'm in certain areas and I'm freehanding stuff I'll come in with um, shields and stuff? Um, no, not shields. Um, intercoat. Mm. I'll just, just to lock it? Well, I'll just shoot where my line is supposed to go, with, and now mm-hmm. I'm drawing an invisible line, and the, the only way it's disappearing it's is kind of like clear coating it. It's right? bloodline, exactly yeah. like yeah. that. So yeah. I'll, I'll draw, I'll draw a hair that way. You know what I mean? That's not a bad idea, man. So huh. it's, it depends if it's like flat white, you're not going to see it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If it's a darker color or even a mid tone, it works really well. So mm-hmm. I'll go in there. Once I get my shape, you know, I'll turn the light at a certain angle, and I could see it, and I'll come in and just start shooting my colors. And then once it's cleared, it's gone. You're never going to see it. So. Yeah, that's actually pretty smart. Yeah. Now, do you use, like if you're doing hair or, or different finites like that, do you use a razor blade? Or are you cutting? Um, I never cut into the surface. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I've never cut you, onto the you, surface ever. Okay. Yeah. yeah I've seen a guy, he was airbrushing a, a bag, and then he, he pulled his masking paper, whatever, and he's cutting his image out on the bag, sticks it back into place, blows his color, and... I was like, oh man, that's going to be a nightmare to clear. Yeah, the you know, the, there's the cutting method that you know you have to be super. You got to fucking cut your your blade out to where it's like damn near like a fucking fifty percent angle or whatever you sure. want to say, and just barely drag it. But then even then, you're you're still cutting through the sure. the clear coat or the base coat, which creates like a uh, it's it, a little canyon. It's yeah. A, yeah, and it's a separation where it, as paint that shrinks, thickness. Yep. yeah, yeah, shrink back. So it, it, you can always tell because you'll end up seeing them uh, clear coat it, and then once it's been in the sun a couple of times, you'll come back and see a yeah, nice little lines. cut line around yeah, everything. Yeah. And, and the, that's just part of like learning this stuff, man. Yeah. You know, it, you could do the cuts before. You can, you know, I, one of the guys that I, I saw airbrushing or was around, his name's uh, Mike Sissel. He's fucking phenomenal, but he cut everything on the part. But he had his shit put out, and he never just, has an issue. Wow. He's just he's a traditional sign painter. You know, he came from that world, big time into artists. He used to work for Iron Horse back in the day right. as their production yeah. painter and does all their, he did their one-off paint jobs. Fucking phenomenal. Do you still, I remember you, I remember hearing his name in another podcast that you had previously. He works for the other side customs. Oh, that's, okay. Yep. I'm not allowed to be around there. Right, so. right, right. Yeah. The, the drama <laughs> on there. Yeah. Tim, who's your, who's one of your favorite airbrush artists? Who, who did you get your inspiration from? Um... God, there's so many. I know. I mean, there's but, there's so many. Uh, from you, the, from the illustration side, I, I would probably say Mark Fredrickson, hmm. which you know a lot of a lot of people haven't heard the newer you know the younger guys they don't know who he is, but he, I think him and Drew Blair, um, were the ones who started the eraser yeah and the scratching style you know spray color in take away spray some more color erase more scratch here, to create all these like unique textures and stuff. Do you so. know who Sano Sanda is? Who? Sano Sanda. Do no. you know that name? No. Okay, so he would do work, more of the robotic type stuff, the airbrush artwork, Penthouse Magazine. Right. Was, was a big thing. You would have um, 
Olivia. You would have Olivia who would mm -hmm. do the pinups in there, mm -hmm. and then you'd have Seno Sanda. Seno Sanda was a big Japanese artist who would do a lot of the. Was uh, it Soriyama though? Soriyama is a big one too. Yeah, Soriyama is right. a huge. I mean, that's it's yeah, a Chrome, those, right? That's a Chrome, right? It's yeah. a Chrome robots. And yeah, yeah. Seno Sanda was was part of that as well. He was a big inspiration. I think I feel like yeah. Noah was pretty like oh, his, his yeah. style back in the day. I liked it a lot. He had that yeah. real soft. Is he still? He, 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 he's, he's all doing Disney. A, he's doing a lot of stuff for Disney. Huge canvas. Yeah. Huge what? canvas. Yeah. He's running his uh, classes and stuff like that. So, Which um, is, I can vouch for, I, I won a scholarship for one year. You did? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. For Noah? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. But he's just, he has a hundred things going on at once. I mean, on a business mind, on the custom paint, that he has it down. Yeah. In going back to the classes, you know, I really feel that they should artists should emphasize and share their their business mind because that's where I I lack. Well, yeah. Jason and I were talking about we're building something together. Yeah. But I know you were having something as a while too, and I would take your class in a freaking heartbeat. Yeah. And yeah. I, I would be honored seriously to yeah. do that. But I think that's something maybe we can talk about. Do you plan on doing something for twenty twenty? Maybe I do. Better? Um. I met a few people at the classes and stuff, and they're wondering when am I going to put something together. But I have to gear towards each student. You know, is it going to be a beginner's class, <laughs> an in intermediate, or an advanced class? You How know? do you like working? DJ with would the... be one of my advanced students. You know what I mean, and stuff like that. How do you like work when you? Because I know you did the airbrush art circus thing. How do you like working with the Createx and that shit? Like um, I can't work with it. I normally don't. I used to use it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I used it for, you know, a few projects and it, it just, you know, it, it took a long time to dry, but the way it's formulated now, it, it, it works fantastic. Yeah, it's much better now. It worked it's... great. I liked it for the class, so. See, yeah, I, and I, I was I'm... even saying, you know, because I'm asking, you know, is this light fast? Is it going to hold up? Yeah. Because this is Arizona and any artwork is going to dry up just like that, you know, especially yeah. when the summer comes. So and I'm, I'm asking, you know, so what is their candy line? How does it hold up? Well, it all just depends on you know what type of clear you put it put on it. You know, does it have the right amount of UV and stuff like that? Yeah. So if I could switch, yeah, I think I might switch a little bit. You know, just to cut down some odor in the you know my workspace. Yeah, yeah. The VOCs. Do you find? I mean, we know Createx. I mean, it has a, a minute little bit of VOC into it there. When you airbrush now, do you wear a respirator? I have a vent going. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Flush out from there. I mean, my my spring is very minimal. You know, you're going out. Are you using more? It's funny when people think I love of, picking my nose after a long day and getting those white and just black getting all the color <laughs> the out is there. so fun. I used to I used to run a detail shot back in the day and all the wool. We would have all the yeah, yeah. same thing for the things on there. Do you find I guess this is um, as far as um, the material wise, like the urethanes and stuff like that? Do you? Reduce a lot of your stuff down because I, I think a lot of painters right now when they when they think of doing finite airbrushing they think of using the microns or the super small like the what is it the HB series of the Iwatas but I would always use just an Eclipse just the regular Eclipse and you could do some finite detail mm -hmm. with that. Do if you, you have, have a brand new Eclipse, brand new airbrush anything? It's gonna airbrush like a micron. <laughs> it'll be yeah. it'll be super because it comes out just like yeah, butter. It's fucking right. like, well, yeah. no, it, it's all your needle and cone. So yes. so yeah. It, it, it's all just how you reduce it. Okay. Reduce it very, very much, mm -hmm. and and bump your pressure down to like ten. You you know, just, sometimes. That because I've seen you work, and it's right. like, I don't know. It's it's awesome to see how you just ah, there are all those, you know, you're feathering that material in there mm -hmm. and, and working that mm -hmm. way. Well, I'm working with two mixtures of paint. Okay. Um, a hot mm -hmm. and a very reduced. Hot meaning like dark. It's like straight black or straight white, you know, okay. put a little bit of reducer in. And those are my dark spots, you yeah. know what I mean? And forgive and, me, you were talking about cut and blow before. What is that process? Cut and blow, say if it's a face or whatever, okay. you would print out the face to scale, whatever. Okay. So you would cut the outline of whatever, put it down, mm -hmm. just dust a little bit of color in. Oh, so you're boxing it in. Exactly. You're basically getting your proportions You're, ma you're mapping it out. You're mapping your proportions in there. Yeah. Nice. And then okay. you come in and then you start fleshing it out. Sense. So what do you think about like the school concept? Like what what do you think? How would that? How could you apply that to nowadays culture and whatnot? You know that's a good question. I guess uh, one 
it would be a, you'd have to price it where you know you know that's my biggest thing is, is some of the, the materials alone but to take some of these classes that's the only reason why I didn't go to the circus it was just here it was like 750 mm -hmm. don't get me wrong I know it's worth it I've been to some of the rendezvous at, at coast but man I'm a painter I'm not yeah. rich, you know what I'm saying? That's my own, but... What would you like to see as far but as... But a school, as far as a school, you know... So you can get some government grants? Yeah, that, <laughs> you know, I think mine was, because like I said, it was while I was in high school, is when they were teaching it. It was like a vocational it's school. Tech, yeah, and, that's awesome. But I don't know, maybe a... Well, if you think about the business behind school, and you think about how, like, for a, a physical location, you know salary for the instructors and all yeah. the administrative and then you look at like how you're going to sell classes to somebody interested right so obviously you got to get like government grants and, and scholarships and all these other things involved yeah because now that 700 hundred dollar class for a week now it's a twenty thousand dollar certificate class sure. over the course of x amount of months and me personally maybe i i i think that this whole game is a muscle memory game that you learn over time of doing this stuff over and over and over again. That's why when you do it consistently, you get better. Yeah. All those things that you learn, sometimes like it takes a conversation and then it triggers that, fuck, I remember that. I knew that. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. And then you go apply it to your artwork and like, damn, I just talked to somebody, remembered some shit I learned a long time ago through a conversation and then reapplied it to my now 8,000 hours of skills I've been putting in. It, it, it's a time thing. And a lot of and a lot of schools have, you know, their selling point is like they're going to like we're going to job placement you after the thing. I think that the best thing to do is for people to find and respect the the traditional um apprenticeships, you know? Absolutely. That's huge. Absolutely. Huge. You know, like but the biggest thing is like people don't want to take trash out. They don't want to sweep up. If you have a custom paint shop, I've got vi I've done time lapses of me sweeping out my paint booth. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I do it with a little broom so I can get all the cracks, all mm -hmm. the corners, and make sure every stroke and everything. There's so much involved in you know. Me and Matt talked about this on the podcast we did. There's so much involved with operating a workspace with business side of things with then learning how to then then you know just giving yourself all right i need to twice a week work on my pinstriping just pulling lines for no no money just i need to pull lines I need to pull lines I need to pull lines that's another hour another Discipline. hour another hour it's like awesome, that's why I like, like like when you see like all these like these guys like you know f my buddy steven from finish fx striper in NorCal, the Falkenberry, I think is his name out there. Mm -hmm. These dudes just sit there and stripe. They go in their garage and they fucking stripe all the time. And I've watched them go from not not that they were not good, but I just watched their work just evolve over a year. There's an old saying. I used, I did that when I first started striping. It was the old thirty days, thirty nights. If you want to become a striper, get in there. Thirty days, thirty nights. Try it out. I learned from Steve Kafka, who mm -hmm. yeah. taught me, but. When he showed me, it was the same thing. He's like, get in there. Just do it. Don't, yeah, it's don't all it just is. go in your garage. And I had neighbors come over. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm striping, striping, so, striping. Some of us got real lucky when we worked in the, the bike industry in the, in the mid-2000s where you had this just bike after bike after bike. Like, a, I had a job where I literally airbrushed every day. I wasn't great, but every day. Oh, this one, we're putting a girl's face on this one. This one's getting the predator. This one's getting real fire. It's like every day I was on that airbrush. You know, did this you was for the held, chopper industry I, back when you yeah. did it. Yeah. Did you feel held back doing the kind of a, see my problem was I always felt like I was held back because I was a logo king. I'm not kidding you. One day I think I, I 37 Harley Davidson tanks logoed. Yeah. You know, and you get paid. Well, I it's flag hour. So I got paid uh, an hour a tank. And it was funny if I could go into this. Yeah. It was my birthday that day. And the guys went out on lunch, and I was fucking left behind. I couldn't believe it. I don't know if they did it as a joke or what. I'm like, you, and I got so pissed. But I'm not kidding you. I, I logoed tanks like it, there was no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I'm not kidding you. I think I, I did some good hours that day. But getting back to it, 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 I feel like it hindered me a little as far as wanting to be like a level as Tim because it was like I was just doing this every day. It was a robot. It mm -hmm. kind of got, 
it was hard getting everything to look the same, believe it or not. You yeah. do a true, true fire, and you had to make them all look the same because Harley's like, hey, yeah. this one's off a little. Mm. So I did that shit for a while too, man. And you, know what? you know how I look at it now, though? I look at it like if as this multi this, this industry constantly changes like the styles what's popular what's this you you are skilled at that now like yeah. if if you ever had to make yeah. some money to put a logo on a tank like yeah. you're fucking good yeah. Yeah. you know so it's like if you look at every skill like i mean i understand it's it's definitely it's definitely inspiring to sit here and look at the other artists in the world and be like fuck man like if i could just be there but i can promise you this from all the artists i know they're doing the same thing there is no such thing as like I made it in the custom paint industry because as soon as you got where the top was, there, there. Then Corey St. Clair comes along, and now the top's here. And then Steve Gibson comes along, and then Ryan Townsend comes out of nowhere. And these guys are constantly doing it. So you're you're playing this this chase game, but you you, you don't want to be so hard on yourself that you never enjoy your art. Yeah. You know, and that's just the place you got to find yourself at, man. Like you gotta mm-hmm. you gotta you know like. I'm in love with Austin Poland's work right now. Yeah. But it's not my work. You know what I mean? He does influence my style, but I still love the fact that when I look at my helmet that I'm like, that's still mine. You know, that's still my, that's still me influenced by him and him and him. And now it's, it's my own thing, yeah. you know? And that's one thing when people think about like, what is my thing? We're, you know, you ask any artist of, you know, surrealism, they all love Van Gogh and then they loved you know other painters from the the times like everybody's influenced by an artist and so it's like this constant of like this artist and this artist fucked and then i was made you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like that's what it becomes right you know and sometimes you get artists like steve who takes art from other cultures and other styles and brings that old painting vibe to airbrushing and it changes the look of it yeah you know or whoever was the first was it cartoon that started creating that that airbrush style for the uh for the lowrider scene that kind of created this whole like you see like the style of airbrush you do you see that you're like that's fucking lowrider mm-hmm. you know what i mean mm-hmm. so i don't know man like Definitely. it's so crazy when you you know when as me i think about it like you know 10 years ago you look at rod fuchs and you'd be like he does the sickest dragons the sickest skulls ever skulls. yeah you know and he still does it, it have that's you seen his, the skateboards he's been doing what what gets it's crazy is he'll goalie yeah. And I'm like, how in the hell are you doing that without? Because are you pre-masking after or before? Or because you know you could lift that up real easy after it's cleared. Is he putting coats in between? That, even you would then, have to. Even yeah. then, though, have, well, that's one risky. thing that a lot of painters like a lot of a lot of painters don't have patience, and they don't realize that a lot of really intricate designs is multiple multiple layers yeah. of clear. Mm-hmm. So Roderick would use. I said his full name like. That. Government name, uh, Rod. He's Canadian, so yeah. He's Roderick. Rod. He he would do multiple layers of clear because he did a lot of brushwork on top of it, and brushwork's thick. So, and able to bury it and lock it in, and come back with the next layers of things. He would clear things multiple times. You know, so a ground metal painting might have four or five clear sessions on it. You know, and then that's the same thing with the helmet game. I was gonna say your helmets probably have the same, don't they? Well, we we've. With the motorcycle helmet, we struggle with the limitations of the of the gaskets because we, uh, since they're not made in America, we don't have access to all those gaskets, and some of them are form fitted to the helmet, mm-hmm. so you can't rip them off because they rip off literally. You gotta mask off. Folks. Yeah, so you have to mask off. So then, with that mask off, you have a mill thickness that you can go to. Yeah. So if you flake them out, graphic them out, so clear flake clear, graphic clear, leaf stripe clear, and then everybody knows like you can't like if you leaf work you can't have your final layer of clear can't be right on top of the leaf because that leaf will soak it up in the sun or whatever so your clear needs to be under two separate layers of clear coat session yeah that way it doesn't bleed back through so these are things that like you know the great thing about this industry and the great thing about social media and all this stuff that we're doing now is we don't have to be in competition with each other. Right, right. We can talk. Absolutely. We can work on ourselves. And all we're doing is raising the bar of what's capable in custom paint. And everybody's getting better. And it's just a much better place. And, like, standing across the parking lot, like, I don't fuck with those guys because, you know, my customer went over there and they gave them $10 less. And right. You know what I mean? Like, that bullshit's yeah. over, man. Back in the day, I think artists were lucky in the environment that they grew up in. What I mean by that is, like, let's say that you lived in L.A. or you lived in a big city, right? Like 
New York, and you were part of that scene, not just doing the artwork. Like, let's, let's say as an artist, you're an amazing artist, but you live in Oklahoma. You're yeah. not getting any exposure at all. Obviously, social media now has embraced that, and we're able to do that. Do you ever find yourself, Tim, Jace, do you ever wish that you were in a different area now? Or do you ever retrospect and be like, man, I wish I would have been there in this time frame? When I, was, when I first started, I wished that I was around here. Okay. You know, Phoenix, Phoenix or okay. LA or something. But now I don't. I we were just talking about. I was like, now I, I have. We we've been talking. I've been considering moving out here. But mm-hmm. I, none of my work is from here. You will. You know. You know what I mean. None of my paint work is from we're here. Go but back it's just a weird here. thing. It's like um, I don't know. Like I was kind of. We were kind of talking about it a little bit at dinner. It's like I feel like I don't know. I don't know 100. percent So I might be stepping out of my my boundaries here, but. I feel like because of the the history of custom paint here, it's it's always kept artists down. You know what I mean? Like the artists have never flourished here the same way that like paint shops did. You know what I mean? Like like Mike Learn had to leave this motherfucker just to stay alive right, in it. Right. You know what I mean? But do you think Mike Learn of today would have succeeded with the social? Media I think Mike Learn. I, th- I don't think people give him enough credit. I think what he did he is the smartest thing you can do as an artist. Yeah. You create a name and you let yourself evolve naturally by what you become in love with and he was always in bands and he yep. loved building guitars yep. he, I, remember getting, I remember getting a pamphlet at my house all of a sudden I got one junk mail and it said Mike Learn Studios 10P and I'm like yeah. what the fuck his Fucking, advertising point was on game I mean yeah. he was but he had to advertise that way because there wasn't a social media I mean this yeah. is way back right. in the very first of MySpace in there so it's kind of like sad in a way I'm like fuck Mike come back like let's get back in the mosh pit. But he does. Why would anybody want to get back into this shit though? No, I understand. Right. You know? I understand. Well, that's the thing is, I bounced from so many companies is because just what you said is yeah. they held you down. Mm-hmm. You had to paint thirty yeah. tanks and nobody knew who you were. Right at the exactly. end of the day, right? Yep. You just collected. How many each magazines, other? bikes have you painted that you never got a fucking credit? Correct. For? All well, the time, right? I'm gonna throw this out real quick too because I've got when I first started. Like I purchased my bike through through Scottsdale Harley, and they were calling me every other day. They're like, "Hey, can you paint this? Can you paint this?" And I was like, "Don't you guys have a company?" We do, but they charge too much. I'm like, are you kidding me? So that is a huge anomaly right there. Yeah. What is yeah. wrong with this picture? Is, is that something that you see? Do you see Phoenix as the next like rising up? Because we see a lot of companies that are out here, and there's a ton of amazing economy wise it, it's a great place because wise, yeah. you have you have space the the i mean the rent that you're telling me some of these places cost i'm like fuck dude like it's, it's cheaper than dallas you know what right. i mean it's yeah. doable absolutely um, you can if i can do you can you know the, it, yeah. the selling point for me to come here is like i have so much going on in cali all the time and that's a day's ride dude, or a day's five drive hours away and right. without bam, being exactly. in me too like if i need to go to yeah. troy lee or if i need to go to specialized bicycle it's morgan hill maybe seven hours I can leave at five in the morning. I'm there by two, one o'clock in the afternoon. It's, it's just doable. I wouldn't want to be in the like. I feel like I'm out of the rat race. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? To where, you know, I don't like. I don't have a sign in front of my shop. I don't have business cards. I don't. I don't do any of that shit. I just post a helmet, and then twenty dudes ask me how much, and then one or two of those guys get on get on the books for the next couple of months, and that's been working for a year now. Mm-hmm. It, it could bubble. It could bust, but mm-hmm. it, it's such a it's. It's so not stressful, right. you know what I mean, that I've been able to put time into this and the other things in my life that I want to do and see if I'm good at You know, that's the other weird yeah. thing about being an artist is, like, I genuinely like watching movies. I love watching movies, and now I've, I've, I'm a fan of it to where, like, I don't say I want to make a movie, but I want to do something more creative in that aspect of doing some type of videoing. Yeah, and that's what we talked about, the documentary. Yeah. I think that's something key yeah. that we should definitely... Yeah, so to move forward. That as well as our as our show, as yeah. far as I mean, our, not our show, but our, our class, our class. I think that's something huge to do. That well, maybe once we start getting that class locked Figured in, out, we're yeah. thinking everything, all the details of it. We can move forward and and, it, and I just feel like you want to continue to evolve as an artist, and you want to find ways to not feel like you're painting the same shit you painted ten years ago. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, redundancy it, it gets stagnant doing the same thing over and over and you need to release it in another avenue mm-hmm. you know and you know just like Mike Learn you know he plays he's got his band and stuff like that so 
Yeah, he that's found his it. thing, you know. Do you remember the airbrush magazine that him and his wife put out? Oh yeah, like learn. Them? Those were the best. Those yeah, were great. Mm -hmm. Those that whole website, the, the whole yeah. fucking culture he, he had. Informed. He was the first dude in our industry to say "fuck you" to the norm thing. Yeah, yeah. he's like, yeah. yeah. And you know what? Those fucking I can't remember. They, were they were they Badger airbrushes? No, they were Airwater. No. Well, the he airbrushes. Got rid of the Airwaters on. He put them all. He announced it. I think it. Was. No, they were Rich Pins. Rich pin air rushes. Yeah, I think it was those. Rich I pin. fucking liked those for a while. Oh, yeah. They were great, and then, yeah. but it was when Mike Learn got it, he did his own little polishing and grinding to certain things, and it, I loved it, dude. Mm -hmm. He had That's one called the is. Phoenix. Mm -hmm. I fucking I do love vaguely that. remember that now. Yeah, the Mojo. Yeah, the is Mojo. Still, is Mojo. he still doing those? I don't think so, man. Really? I don't know. I think he is he in Colorado? Pache. Yeah, he's in uh, Boulder. He is in. Do you remember him moving? Pache's? There. Yeah. Yep. That's crazy. But yeah, I mean, like he he you know he went against the grain. He didn't do because at the time, and everybody was doing our water, our tool, fucking airbrush you know, action magazine, airbrush action. You know, they were they were kind of falling in this pit, and that's one thing that we talk about all the time is that artists rarely try to stand up for anything because they're so grateful for any kind of shout out, any kind of love from a company. You know, fucking you can get like anybody can give an artist a, a gallon of clear, and they're like, I well guess. Guess I work for you forever now. Like it's like we're it's really love. grateful, you know. Because yeah, right. you don't really get shit. Yeah. It goes back to what we were just saying about how like <laughs> yeah, exactly. you feel so suppressed. <laughs> Sticks and strangers. You feel so suppressed doing work for so long, you know, because you, you know you're an artist. You're not really a businessman. You know what I mean? Right. And so it's it's kind of getting to a point where I'm trying to be more of a businessman and preach it to other artists and be like, hey man, like I might not have the answers, but maybe. Maybe I can spark something and you can figure it out or whatever the case may be, but I'm tired of seeing broke, dude, broke fucking artists, man. Like, it breaks my heart. Some of the guys in the industry that, that I grew up following and, and wishing I could do what they do, yeah. and then knowing they have nothing, they have no fucking, they, they're 50 something years old looking for the next job. Like, that shit is sad to me, man. Yeah. You know? And I mean, they might have had a drug problem. I don't fucking know, but. You just, I don't know, it just seems like it, it's always the same story. Like, certain people get just fucking used and used and used and, and you know, never really kind of grow from it, you know? I think every day we usually have about 50 people that will send me pictures. Hey, can you post this? Can you do this? And sometimes it makes you feel really good when you help somebody out that is just starting out. But you can tell that they definitely have their heart in the right place, their intent. And if I give them a little bit of a shout out... It's an awesome feeling. They write me back. They're like, oh, my God, thank you. You gave mm -hmm. us love or whatever. That's an amazing thing. What were some of the things that you first got into, Tim? Like, did you first get into magazines? Were you starting to get exposure that way? Or did you get more of just like the shows when people started to see your work? I think, it, that... I think it was when I went out on my own. Right. Yeah. So you got out of the whole... Yeah. I was no longer under this company name. Nice. Right? Nice. Yeah. yeah. And so once I started doing artwork... Mm -hmm. The only thing it was is my signature, and people nice. seen that, and they started seeing my artwork, and, and it just spread, you know, through social media by word of mouth around here in town, mm -hmm. and that's how it, it really started. You know, and I always knew that it would start, it would pop off like that if yep. I went on my own and just created uh, my own brand and my name. Yep. Whatever happened it. with the raw edge shit? That was. <laughs> <laughs> I heard some rumors. Yeah. What are, the, what are your I rumors? heard he got fucking, he had like a pill thing or a drug thing going on behind. I cannot confirm or deny that. <laughs> <laughs> Did he get raided on the way to Sturgis, though? I cannot confirm or deny that. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of drama in there. But um, overall, he, he was a good dude. He was? He was? A good, he, okay. he, he, yeah, he was a good dude. And, uh, you know, he, we, he just had a... Uh, some really bad ways to approach the business and, and stuff like that. Yeah. But, but bottom line, that was probably one of the greatest companies I've worked for. It was, for real? Yeah, because I was crazy. working with Matt, you know. It was fun. We had a blast there. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like everybody's dream job for an artist, like a place where you can kind of just focus on being creative and doing the work yeah. and your bills are being paid and you're you're not struggling looking for the next thing. You're not locked into a certain customer's are giving you the uh, old you're going to do it this way and this is exactly right right and it was like process. every day it was electric because he was bouncing ideas and i was bouncing ideas yeah. and then our styles were like so similar 
You know what I mean? People couldn't tell yeah. who did this and who did that. So we that. should probably yeah, fill in, what is Rye Edge? I mean, just so our listeners know a little bit more about the history of it. Well, I don't I don't know much. I mean, that's when we, me and you first talked was in Galveston when you were there Correct. with them. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, they just made a strong push in the industry, you know, because here in Phoenix, like when the bagger thing took off, right, Eric Carr and was it still Vision Garage? Like that, that was like the go-to spot in America, if you wanted a baddest bagger winner, like okay. you know, it was a 13, 14. So, 15. who is the artist? It, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, then that's what's crazy because there's also, I mean, fuck, you had what was it, Nick Lee, or what was his name, or what was the other guy's name? You had you. Did Matt ever do anything for Lee Diaz? Oh, that Lee Diaz. Lee Diaz, right. yeah. Lee Diaz got on um, towards the end. Yeah. And, and He's the, the one that did went. the bike for All-Star Baggers. That, so that was one of the things that pissed me off because I, I was doing all All-Star's work. Uh-huh. And I ended up – this is before I really started valuing myself. I was doing three baggers for nine grand, right? Wow. What? Yeah. At the same time, they had one bagger here, mm-hmm. a Road King. They paid $13,000 to have – uh, you right. know, still vision painted, right. mm-hmm. and of course, I mean, I'm pissed, but I still need that fucking nine grand to pay my rent, pay the bills, yeah. and that was kind of like one of the things that kind of put me on the path of trying to like own myself a little bit more and be able to make my own prices and 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 was be that able to. Pretty comp- much when you left and went home and started doing it out of your. No, I mean, I was I was already, already doing it by okay, myself, but the, you know, okay. just. I was still focusing on my local market to take care of me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then, of course, when we when we got out of the baggers, you know, it, it's really expensive to ship a bagger. It's actually cheaper to ship the entire bike than the tins, yeah. right? So when we started doing the dinas and shit, like, these dudes can fucking throw them in a Home Depot box and ship them from anywhere in the country to me for $90. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then, you know, when you're looking at the, the cost of, like, painters out here in the, on the West Coast— and even on the East Coast, like, you know, if I did a fucking diner for 3500 bucks, like, I'm fucking getting it, dude. I'm fucking like, yeah. that's like a $10,000 bagger to me. You know sure, what I mean? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, now it ain't anymore because of just the way prices and inflation and all that shit is. But right. back in the day, it was. And, um, you know, uh, it just sucked, man. It sucked because, you know, you, you, you're doing all this three fucking baggers for one sure. shop. And then all they did, just one to another shop. It just it showed me what they valued me at. Yeah. And I I don't I did maybe two more baggers than the rest of, and I just kind of phased them out and like priced them out of, and now they're kind of I don't even know if they're still in business to be honest with you, but it just sucks, man. And it yeah. it it can't really I mean it's kind of weird, right? Like when you think about like bitching about all the shops that you deal with, it's like it's all money race and a rat race, you know. It's it's just about. Those guys hustle you better than we hustle them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I mean, fuck, dude. I, I remember I helped a dude start a shop. He's still a shop in Dallas. I helped him start a shop. I painted the bikes and built the bikes for him. And he was just a powder coater. And then I never really cared. I mean, this is before he was doing social media advertising before I ever thought about it. So, mm-hmm. and funny how, like, his social media is, like, nothing, <laughs> you know, now. But yeah. the thing is, like, he literally came to my shop one day because I posted a picture of the bike I was painting for him online. I didn't tag him. or This is before tagging was a thing. Right, right. He came to my shop, was talking to me like I was his fucking employee. Like I was like, he was like, dude, I asked you never to post anything that you do for me. Like he was that insecure about anybody seeing that I did the work over him. Like right. he wanted everybody to think yeah. that he painted them. Right. He built them. He's the guy, right? And I was like, that's got to be the worst fucking lie you could ever tell yourself. Yes. You know what I mean? How like, counterfeit. How, it's so much cooler to know, like, to put out the fact that, like, you know what? My team builds and paints some of the sickest bikes out there. You know what I mean? Like, that's a way better place to be when you uh-huh. think about it, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely. Huge. It's integrity. I think it's karma as do well. Do you see a lot of builders doing that nowadays? Because I do. Because I see that where they're, where they're building, and I'm not going to drop any names. There's no fucking way. Oh, they still any, do it. There, I see names. I see names out there every day of guys doing baggers, and I'll see him put up stuff, and I'm like, "Hey, I know who did that." I'm like, "It would have taken you two seconds to copy that yeah. person to say that, or just give them a shout out. Two seconds. It's free." It's like I said, 
because because I don't have to market myself to the same like area that I live in. Right. I don't have to deal with the whole. I, I get to pick the customers I want for the most part, but maybe arrogant. I don't fucking know if you want to say it, but it's like it, a lot of the shops in Dallas will work now. They might be bigger and longer but in the world of like what can i do for you versus you do for me right like if i paint a bike for you and i post it and tag you in it Mm -hmm. i don't really work on bikes or customize them anymore so you have more to gain for me showing my audience that you exist in some aspects right as opposed to like i can only you know hand i might only do one bagger next year that's i've been wanting to get out of them completely but you know if that's the case then like yeah Who's really I don't, I don't need four more from you because I'm not going to take them. <laughs> you right, know what right. I mean? Yeah. So yeah. it's it's a weird place, man. Like all this marketing and all this shit, it's it's a weird thing. It's kind of it's a blessing because you get to pick what you want to do and yep. and stuff. But when you're when you're from where we're from, you know, and the the cutthroat. And I, I remember working at a at a bike shop, painting bikes, getting off work and going to a lowrider shop and doing a hood mural and doing like checkered flags on race cars and shit and going to do real fire you know now and then paint jobs real flames with flame jobs on top of it like just spent years doing that shit and then like you know (laughs) then you look at it now you're like fuck man like i wish i had that same energy it's basically what i do yeah yeah (laughs) jim do you do you see yourself as far as doing anything like a youtube channel or stuff like that exposure that way I was thinking um, either that or doing kind of like a, a Patreon type classes, you know, where I have like, I don't know, 100 people following me, yeah. you know, paying that money. And then I would teach them all the things that I know for sure. the past 30 years, you know. Um, and then could you be more specific, like as far as like with the beginner class and the intermediate exactly. class? Yeah, and then that way cover you could, all you could, of them. Yeah, yeah. I like mm-hmm. that. That's, that's a great thing. And, you know, that may be a solution to a type of schooling, right? Yeah. You well, know. it's like anything, the schooling stuff. I mean, there's plenty of that now, you know, but... And then you can monetize it according to their ability. Yeah, yeah. But it, most important overall of any airbrushing or any type of artistic skill, you need to learn how to draw. And it, that's I very, fucking very important. I agree with you 120%. And people don't, people don't understand that. Man, you know, Tim, I see don't. that every day. Even in my tattoo shop, I have people that come in there and they're phenomenal as far as pulling line with tattoo machines and whatever. I'll see that. I'm like, mm-hmm. wow, that's great. Can you draw? Well, I can go ahead and look at this, and I can trace it out, and I can recolor it. That's not what I'm asking. Could you draw? Can you physically draw yeah. something? You know what? And do that? I've always, I've always thought that drawing and even airbrushing is all that anybody can do. It. It's literally like a learning. It's a skill that totally. you acquire. Yes. And it, something that like is so proven is like when you see those people that would drew those progression of like doing drawings with like pencil or, or, yeah, or matte yeah. pencils like and shit. Be- 2012, yes. 2018, yeah. Yeah, you see those, it's like that's what, that's the 10,000 hours, dude. Like, yep. you yeah. keep doing that shit and it goes there. And the yeah. problem is, is and that. See, so when, when he went from a, a newbie learning how to draw, and then now he's pretty badass now. So, with those drawing skills and the knowledge of shading, highlights, and so forth, he can translate into tattooing, yeah, into airbrushing, and anything else. Exactly. Even oils. Okay. But you have it. That's where it all starts is from drawing. A lot of people just don't get it. it. It becomes a patience thing. And like I said, honestly, if I didn't have the job doing it younger, then I might not have ever got to where I am, you know. But being forced to sit there and, like, I, guess, I guess I'm doing a tiger today. You know what I mean? Like doing yeah. that shit, it just makes you kind of get better at it over time. But Absolutely. But, well, yeah, if you keep doing it, man, like that's all it say, is. Wouldn't you agree that both of you, all three of you actually, because we're all artists here, Picked up a crayon probably when you when you could talent that's has has to go you, you could practice I don't, I don't you. know I, what, I, what's your opinion on that I don't I mean, think I, you know what I think I think the only thing that you might not be able see if I can word this right the only thing that's could be translated as ta- talent is vision vision is the one thing that I don't know if you can actually learn vision you can right. learn. I mean, I think that you can get a better understanding of, of working the canvas that you're using through time and effort. But, you know, like, that's the strangest question I get asked a lot. It's like, how do you create that? <laughs> like, what? Yeah. You know, like, it's just, it's just, so the, the technical the skill. Is that what you're, like, the vision of it? You know like what the struggle? Like, kind of, or, you know. When I got deep into art and I wanted to figure out what fucking artist I was, you know, I was, I'm like, 
sitting here. I'm like every fucking artist. Like I'm sitting here listening to Tool all fucking day long, looking at Alex Gray art and other visionary art, and I'm like, what the fuck, man? Who am I? Who am I in this mix? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like it just it doesn't work that way. Light art is a lifelong goal of figuring out who you are. I mean, maybe there's that guy that's 18 years old and stumbles across like a talent or a vision of his skill and he's got the skill to kind of apply it and he's a phenomenon or some shit. But, mm-hmm. you know, one of the best books I ever uh, got an audio book on because I don't read books and shit was that uh, Outliers book. And I've kind of been referencing it a little bit tonight about the 10,000 hours thing. And it just, that book was awesome, man. It told me, you know, a lot of people chalk things like that up to skill well, instead of again? outliers. And it really just breaks down circumstances that you would never think make good artists or good athletes or good programmers for things. Like there's so many things that go into play for everybody's life to, there's a reason why Corey St. Clair is who he is and you're who you are and all these things. It might be a lot of things that you can relate to, but at the same time, it it, it just shows that everything is through hard work and, and, and skill and the right time in the in the world, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think you can learn how to do anything you want. It's the, the one thing that nobody ever seems to be able to do is put time in. Consistency. It's the biggest fucking yeah. thing. Yeah. People want it instantly. Yeah. Dude, I want a six pack so fucking bad. Not a beer. Right. I want to get my shit together. But how am I going to do that if I'm going to keep eating like shit and not going to the gym? Like, right, right, right. It, it's the consistency of it's not you don't go to the gym once and then expect and then results. Happens. Yeah, I have to do that shit. It has to be a part of my life, and that's how being an airbrush artist or being a pinstripe or anything has to be like. Or you, learning to martial art. Yeah, same thing. You're not going to go to one class and become yeah. a black belt. You've got to obviously have that structure, and time into that. I think, um, I mean, we've definitely touched on a lot of things like that. As far as, um, like, with the YouTube channel and doing stuff like that, Tim, I think that that would be huge to, to see, you know, your progression that way. Mm-hmm. Do you, um, as far as, like, do you ever look back? Because, like, I, I learned from drawing from, like, Mad Men magazines or, like, Mad Magazines. Mm-hmm. All the, like, um, Gary Larson was yeah. a... Uh, comic book artist and I used to sit there and just like copy and draw and, and go that direction from there have you seen anything lately that's like impressed yourself like when you're drawing and stuff have you been like oh fuck dude, I finally got that level or I got to this point or whatever because I mean you had to have come from some place to where you can do these portraits and you can do these faces right. like amazingly from there and that's the great you can never money can't buy that yeah, that's the yeah. greatest feeling in the world when you come to achievement that way when I do a pinup or something now, and it's right. like, oh my god! You get people say that, oh, you're an artist. I still have a hard time with that. I'm like, oh, I don't even, I don't ever consider right. myself an right. artist. I um, what yeah, do you? S- I, I think it was a, a, a huge turning point for me to start doing um, the digital art pinups and stuff, because as I'm learning on the computer, mm-hmm. you know, I was translating or bringing that into the airbrush. That's and, so cool. And so that. and then my artwork just melded and you're doing that people through, couldn't tell Photoshop? if it was digital mm-hmm. and they couldn't tell if it was yeah. real I struggled yeah. with that looking at some of your work and too. people were like w- because you know I spent so much time on the computer yep. and then I would go airbrush because you know are you matching sitting values in front of, yeah, yeah okay. sitting in front of the computer for hours man it takes a toll on you you're yeah. just sitting there like oh you gotta get up every hour walk around and stuff so airbrushing you're constantly moving you're, yeah. you're getting up to do this. You're, you're doing this, standing up, sitting down, stuff like that. So I, I liked, you know, flopping back and forth to the computer yeah. to airbrush. But doing the pinups digitally, that helped me on seeing all the structure of the face. Nice. You know, the symmetry, everything. You know, when you're drawing- What makes an attractive eye? Yeah. You know, what makes an attractive woman? You know, it's her eyebrows. Eyebrows. Or her eyebrow eyebrow straight across. Mm -hmm. Are they slanted on the ends? Mm -hmm. That's what makes her attractive. Definitely. Those little nuances. So I think even the highlight of the eye of the pupil Mm -hmm. is so crucial. When you look at an eye, I've seen so many portraits that are even offset. I mean, this is that tiny little bit that's offset in those eyes are everything. Because when we look at a face, we look at eyes, nose, mouth. Right? And, and usually in that order, our eyes will, will, will scale down that way. Right. On a portrait end of it. Titties. Titties. Yeah. Straight for the ass, titties, always. But you I mean, know what? you're looking at the face. Yeah. The one thing I liked about a lot of the work I've been watching of yours that I looked at 
And the one thing that I think that has really changed the, the my perception of the art is people using shadows in different more like they're really using light sources now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, totally I think you did some stuff where it's like the the lighting was coming down the chick, and you could see the shadow of her eyelashes and shit on her mm -hmm. cheeks and stuff. Mm -hmm. Those yeah, the things. shadows right here. And stuff. Is that yeah. you changing it up? Like, would you take a normal Playboy model and then, like, it would have a light source coming from maybe under the chin, but you're going to flip that 180 and that's, go. Yeah, and that's a, another thing I like playing with is just um, the dramatic lighting. So you're flipping the script. Yeah, so if it has a lot of shadow on this side in the reference image, I'll go in there and just kind of, you know, lighten it up. Mm -hmm. So now we, we have a reflective light on this side or Love whatever that. it is. Or, like, like the gold digger. Mm -hmm. um, trunk that I did. You yeah. Notice that one. The girl looking at it, the girl on the left, she has lighting coming from this way. Mm -hmm. You know, high, highlighting this side of her boobs and stuff. But then you have light from here and it's throwing shadow of her face down Yeah, they call like it the edge way. lighting or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And. A little bit on the other woman as well. A little bit of lighting coming from I forgot what direction. Well, so. that that stuff that that to me is what creates way more drama in the picture, way mm -hmm. more dramatic Hell looking shit. Yes. And you know that's one thing that that Brian told me that he learned from Corey St. Clair is, you know, with the more detailed shit. Whenever I started focusing through their, uh, you know, their recommendation is to start focusing on the shadows in your shadows. Mm -hmm. Like most people. You know, it's most people when they do an airbrush picture, it's like, okay, well, here under the nose, that's it. But you got that n initial shadow, and then you got the dark shadow right on the crease. Yeah. Those kind of things make a difference, you know? Yes. Under the lips, that's what creates yeah. all the different dimension to yeah. the shit, you know what yeah. I mean? It doesn't, it makes it seem not as flat. Yeah. 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 Is there something next that you, because we find, I mean, I find this as an artist, like, I'm like, fuck, dude, if I could just take like four days off, I would love to draw this, or I have a lot of ideas that I, I want to do next. Is there something next that you're like, man, I wish I just had the, more time to do this, or that I want to do this type of an art or image? All my sculptures. Sculptures are. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, the fucking skulls and shit. Yeah. yeah. That was, um, it, I, I really wasn't that serious about the first one. The first one, was, it looks like a caveman. I have that. Skull. It's I think that's one. No, no, that's the better one. Better yeah, one? That, okay. I think that one's a series two. Okay. So I'm, I'm out with a series three now, and it's perfect now. I'm not going to sculpt it anymore, I promise. <laughs> Man, it's so just, you've my daughter comes in and she goes, Dad, you're sculpting another skull? I'm like, yes, I'm a perfectionist. What else? Yeah. So, you know, the skull, uh, the jaw detaches and everything. You've seen it. Are you doing those out of, like, female? Or are you doing those out of, like, female clay? Or are you... How it's um, it's a, a hardening clay mm -hmm. that you stick in the oven and yeah, it hardens. Female. So once it's hard, that's when I take the mold off. Yep. Yeah. And they just cast it yep. from there? Yeah. Gotcha. That's so cool. So you got some more castings and stuff like that that you're going to... Yeah, you what I want to start doing is make them into, like, devils and stuff like that. Put, like, pirate yes. patches and... Uh, some bandanas. Um, Let's parlay into that. What do you like growing up, movie wise? What were you into? Because we're all the same. Like, like were you into sci-fi? Were you into more like, oh, yeah. Indiana yeah. Jones type stuff? Oh yeah, like, sci-fi or all classic '80s movies. I yep. love you know, and, and that's the stuff that I passed on to my daughter. And I tell her, I said, today's music is shit. How old is your daughter? She's 17, and okay. now she loves '80s music. Right. And Definitely. it's great because I tell her all, yeah. all the music is shit now. And she right. starts listening to this 80s movie. <laughs> you got to watch this movie. You know, put on Breakfast Club first. She, she Fast Times at Ridgemont High. She loves, well, mine, not yeah. that one. But, right. um, you know, she loves all those types of movies now. And no she piece. loves, yeah. it, 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 and, yeah. you know, every uh, once or twice a month, you know, I'll try to find a, a you know, a really uh, obscure 80s movie that I loved. Sure. And we show it to her and she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. You know, yeah, 80s were the best. Oh, yeah. So, such a great, such a diverse, even music too. I mean, obviously music and the movies, all the Amy Herculine and all the uh, uh, Cameron, or what was his name, the guy that did... Um, like sixteen candles and mm -hmm. the Breakfast Club and John Hughes. John Hughes, thank Our you. Yeah, John Hughes. Man. Yeah, John Hughes who did all those. I'm yeah. trying to come in on this conversation. I, I know, can't think I know, of I know. I, know. I, we're like, we're I have exactly uh, a, a very uh, a useless talent. You can name any '80s movies. It has mm -hmm. to be uh, uh, sci-fi. Mm -hmm. You know, all those type action, whatever. Ask me the the name of the movie. I'll tell you what year it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. So Goonies. 
84. 84. Or no, I no, saw, no, 85, sorry. And 85. you know what, Tim? I saw these in the theater, too. Like, yeah, I, really, like, I, so yeah, you I and ten, I both, yeah, it was like, ten, I was 10 years old when I watched it, so. That's yeah. so cool. That's I know. Awesome. I used to go see, I went saw Blade Runner in the theater when 82. it first came out. 82, yeah. Yep. And that was um, Eddie Dick? Or Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick Philip wrote, K. The, Dick book. wrote yeah. the book. They say Eddie yeah. Dick is a yeah. way different. <laughs> well, actually, wasn't that? Wasn't he had some relation to that too? We won't go into all this on the podcast. So a lot of the '80s movies influenced you as your artwork. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now, do you yeah. find like even guys like um, motherfucker? What is his name? The guy that did all the stuff um, for like even Corn, like Jonathan Davis, like his microphone stand. Was, oh, oh Giger. It's Giger. 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 Yeah. Giger. HR guy. When you when you look at his um when you look at his studios alien. in Germany, he would have that alien like crawling down the fucking building. Stuff like that is shocking to me. Like like do you find yourself maybe even doing sculptures like that where you see like that whole alien mm-hmm. thing just mm-hmm. you're walking down the street and you see this huge sculpture coming down. That's a yeah. shock and awe. That yeah, yeah. I think that's an art thing. When you see a fine To me art. that that is like some of the beauty beautifulest artwork I've seen yes. from Giger. It's just straight out of his nightmares. I agree. Totally. And totally. All the alien aliens, yeah, all that stuff yeah. in there that he created on there. Was and then he amazing. got all sexual with it and stuff. And yeah, I don't think I'd let my kids hang out with him. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, totally, totally bizarre, bizarre stuff. Um, as far as ever doing like film do you see yourself ever doing any artistic stuff that way I mean you're such a I mean I'm learning right now you're obviously way into the 80s and you love that movie so I love, did you ever think about making like an independent film I love film? Tarantino yeah. Oh, yeah of course now we're talking just awesome yeah. just yes. awesome and I haven't seen the new one yet so don't say anything no um, I, won't, I won't either but but I, when I was going to um, art institute I had a video production class so I made it was supposed to be a, a 10 15 minute video of whatever you know just to show the teacher that we know how to cut and edit yeah. and sound and this and that so I made this whole script and this whole storyline I had my brothers and friends as actors and we filmed it over the course of the weekend mm-hmm. and once I submitted it she pulled me aside she goes what kind of fucking garbage is this I was Did like, you say that? Yeah. I was like, what? What do you mean? I said, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to edit the sound. She goes, no, this is uh, lewd. And she said, all this crap, it was just pure garbage and this and that. I'm like, wow, thank you. Yeah, you know no I, mean? I wrote and directed it. I filmed it all by myself. Right, right. And so there, I, was, there, were, there was no accolade for that. And you and I come from that, from like even Clerks. I mean, I remember, seeing, I remember seeing Clerks like in the theater right. where you have somebody who just took 20 grand and made an independent film. Right. And Jason becomes you know, an icon in career and makes it from that way. I always thought about, like when you said like uh, – uh, Quentin Tarantino when he did you know like was it Dust to Dawn like the first that was Robert Rodriguez I'm sorry Robert, Robert, Robert Rodriguez mm-hmm. stuff like that is mind blowing I love that movie I think yeah. that was an amazing movie yeah. I love indie films more of the indie-esque type films that yeah. way yeah yeah Napoleon very, very Dynamite cool. that was Napoleon a Dynamite right very much yeah. that way hilarious you know but I think even back talking about John Hughes and stuff like I think even Fer- Ferris Bueller's Day Off was indie-esque in that way it was more of just like a, a cult film, right? Yeah, well, they didn't yeah, think it yeah. was going to be that way. My one of my all-time favorite movies of all time in Texas was Days of Confuse. Oh yeah, Richard Linklater. All right, did that. all right, all right, <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, he. I mean, Matthew McConaughey. You have all these amazing artists that were in there. Um, the Outsiders. The Outsiders mm-hmm. was an amazing '80s movie. Again, yeah, I, I just seen that like a month ago. I was like, man, this is a a very beautiful, beautifully shot picture i want to if so you badly, pay attention to that sort of thing yeah i, it, you, I do yeah i think i think you're absolutely right not just the story but even the way the videography mm-hmm. of, the, of yeah. the movie is so is so good i think um it's exciting to see what you're going to do next i mean i love seeing the instagram and i love seeing your, your stuff on yeah there and, I don't post much you know but but when i do it, it's quality over quantity i think that's you know. the old things like you know, speak softly and carry a big stick. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Like, if you're going to yeah. say something, be come up powerful. Yeah. I like it. I mean, I like that you're here in Arizona. Do you do you see Arizona as far as the art scene growing bigger and bigger? Mm. Or do you think it's pretty stagnant right now? It's difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, you have the whole um, the art walk scene downtown Phoenix. Yeah. And then you have the whole scene with the Scottsdale galleries. Which is the finite. 
Right. Do you see yourself? I see you as a hybrid. I mean, I see you doing. Yeah, both it's kind of both. But that. how do you break into that? Do you think that? Do you think that this? I'm not gonna be painting fucking coca pellies no. all the time just to I make mean, you, know, you if, like, if you think about syrian whatever, right right yeah. if you think about syrian up there in the san francisco bay so area mentioned you have again, a yeah. lot more younger people who are into more uh, but not that i know what your art would be like but you know they're into more of that skateboard and this and fucking custom paint and all this kind of art those guys have money because they're fucking like you know looking to be the edgy guys at, in fucking Google or wherever the well, fuck they the work. Well, the whole you know? Silicon Valley thing, you know, you have all these thirty-year-old, twenty-year-old, some forty-year-old millionaire guys yeah. just you know just killing it there, paying yeah. people to do wall murals and giving them right. stock in Facebook and shit. You know, right, right. But you know the uh, you have to find some you know like certain areas don't have a younger crowd. I don't know. I don't know Phoenix. I'm not here that much, but. <laughs> You know, it makes it hard for certain types of artists to, to kind of get out there when they're the well, artists yeah. can. We could touch on this real good too, like yeah. Shepard Ferry. Right. Shepard had bought some art recently off of Serarium, Phil, mm-hmm. and Phil called me and he was like, "Oh my God, Shepard bought my art piece. I'm now in galleries and I'm starting to progress into this world of it." I think all it takes is a little bit of an edge. Shepard was a genius in that mm-hmm. way. Went to New York, New York school. Yeah. Started just tagging up and getting his name up. It's kind of in the same way. If you have something that's brandable, and if you have that guerrilla marketing mm-hmm. about you, mm-hmm. and that's the way it was with Paint Huffer, a lot of people ask me, they're like, oh man, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't go out blasting that on the side of buildings, but I was constantly throwing it out there. Throwing right. it out there, right there. Yeah, it yeah. Became, a, became a mental image that way. I think, um, I think you can break into the finite part of it. I think people are going to be attracted to that, and they want to do yeah. that. They, they're looking. There's more... Rich people out there that want to just throw their money around, right? Then we know, you know what yeah, I mean. I think yeah. it's, I think it's just very. Much the good thing is, is with social media, you have a direct line to all these rich people. I think Noah right. did that too. We talked right. about Noah a little while ago because he was such an airbrush artist, and then he started doing things for for bigger people, well, bigger he's clientele. He's Anaheim and yeah. Disney and all that. You know, I, I know yeah. a, there's an artist that I kind of grew up with uh, in Dallas, and he was an airbrush guy for a while too. His name was Sergio Garcia. Yeah, I've heard that. And so he created these dope ass. He, he got famous by doing a, a tricycle that he did, and it's like a circle loop, and it was in an airport. And then he started doing these like hands, like just like imagine two hands sticking out, the, out of the wall. Now, what he did was he'd have it like one's rolling a joint, yep. mm-hmm. and one's doing this. And so all these hands, you know, tattooed up or whatever, just doing different things, and it's just coming out of a wall. And next thing you know, those fucking things are people are buying them left and right. Like he went international with that shit, man. It's fucking crazy, and it's it's awesome to see. Like, damn, I used to sit in a garage and airbrush fucking hoods and shit with this dude back in the day, yeah. and he just he wasn't a, a true artist. Like he was, he wasn't like fuck. I'm gonna be the best airbrush artist in the world. He's like, nah, man. Like this is just fun to do now because I'm doing art, but I'm really trying to do this and I'm spray painting shit over here and. Doing like he just kept fucking doing. He found his thing. Do you know know who Grime is out of New York? I mean, out out of San Francisco. Mm, Not sure. Grime, unfortunately, when he was a kid, when you and I were in the eighties, we had the underoos, Mm -hmm. which were the underwear that we'd have like um, the Hulk or Spider Man or whatever. He got too close to a Christmas tree and lit on fire. He's a little kid. Mm -hmm. Burned, you know, a good percentile of his body, maybe eighty percent of it. So um, there was an artist named Sean Barber who was also out of out of San Francisco. And Sean became really famous because he was not so, I mean, he was pretty poor when he moved to San Francisco, but he started doing portraits. He got in Juxtapose magazine and mm-hmm. you know built his name that way too as well. So I think it's having that niche, but Grime became a famous tattoo artist and he came that way, you know, obviously taking his tragedy, what happened to him and developed into art and focused it and became an amazing tattoo artist. And I think that's where in this industry, you have to yell, you have to scream, you have to do something that is out of it. Like you said, with him doing the hands, I remember seeing that even in the magazines too. Yeah. Like I think he was in Juxtapose where they would yeah. show a gallery of all of his stuff on there. And it was a gallery just of the two hands coming out of the wall. There yeah. was nothing else. I mean, it was cut off at the, at the edge of it. I think that's cool when you see stuff like that that's the oddity or something that's, that's different mm-hmm. of, of the normalcy. So whether it's film or art or whatever, it's pretty cool to have that way. Do you um, do you think that you would ever do a gallery yourself, putting on a show like at your own? Because we see we have. If I had enough pieces, yeah. 
Yeah. And I think you would, right? But see, or sculpture wise, maybe. Um, maybe not sculpture, but just painting. Okay. Like I said with uh, within the realm of surrealism, but it, it just takes so much time to come up with that concept. Would you do any mixed media? It would be mixed media. Okay, yeah, it would. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. How cool, man. Yeah. What is the yeah. we have? Because we have here the lowrider art. Uh, what is the one? There is a show here that is put on that has the lowrider art. Uh, not not the winer show. Photography, thank you. That's what it is. So I mm -hmm. see that person like taking a gallery and mm -hmm. financing it for a night. Or is it a night show? Maybe it's a, it's a one night show. It's yeah. a one night show. Yeah. So maybe you could do something like that. You know what I mean? Where we could have perhaps, yeah. But see, but see, my subject matter, you would have nothing to do with what I do. In the no, 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 no. And yeah. that'd be cool. Yeah. Because I think that'd be awesome. I mean, because everybody knows you as one, and then all of a sudden you come right, out and right. flip the script. And and see, the thing I struggled with that a little bit was, you know, I found out from uh, a particular artist. He goes, "Just because you do this doesn't define you as an artist. Mm. As an artist, you can have many avenues." Oh yeah. Of what your art is all about. Right, and I think so, you and I touched on that. And it's like different identities. Today. Basically. Yeah, it is. So, when we go home, I don't talk about a whole lot of this stuff. I'm talking about. My wife is a rocket scientist, so I'm talking about quantum physics and other bullshit that you guys, you'd be like, who the fuck is this Rain Man? You know what I mean? <laughs> but there's, we all have those different personas, you know what I mean? Yeah. There are different things that we have to, it's what our surroundings are. But I think that that would be very cool to see that if you did an art gallery or something yeah. like that. I'd, I'd be I try to that. tell people all the time to, uh, you know, when you build an audience somewhere, you, you have an audience now. Like, mm -hmm. you could, you know, it, it kind of goes against what you're saying, but you can create something that these people would consider art and buy it because it's the art, it's your customer base you've already made, right? right? So that's kind of like when we started this podcast. I'm going to cater to the motorcycle audience that I have and the custom paint audience that I have instead of like, you know what? I'm going to do a travel podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, like, yeah, right. I love travel and I want to be into it, but yeah. I don't have that audience. Right, you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. you know, saying, I tell my brother with the same thing. It's like, dude, you have a biker audience, man. Like, make some music that bikers listen to. Right. You know, and right. not saying that you can't work on these other things, but do this as a way to help finance the next phases. Exactly. You know, that. Maybe this is contrary to being the, the, the romantic, you know, starving artist idea, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing wrong with being a businessman, you know, and, and learning how to make a living doing your art because, you know, there's this badass art you create when you struggle and there's this other badass art when you have to find yourself again. And I think those are two good places to, to, to create something in, you know, and mm -hmm. in, in between as well. So um, I think it's great to have balance. I think that's very well said. Yeah. yeah, you just, man. Because like, you got I mean, to be able to finance your day, no matter yeah. what you do, whatever from there. I mean, there's no retirement in this game. Yeah. Well, we don't have a pension. The sun is coming up tomorrow morning. My landlord's going to be knocking on the door. Yeah. I've got to pay it. And I have a hard time balancing that, too. Do you ever find Tim or Jace or DJ, do you guys ever find that it's hard to take even a couple hours out for stuff like where you're like, oh, i got to get this done, i got this project done, or i got this? Are you workaholics? Are you too much? Are you hard on yourself? I am. I mean, I know that for me, for me to take like an hour off and just chill out and just relax, grab a beer or whatever, like even doing this podcast, I'm like thinking, all right, fuck, I got to do this tonight. I got to do this tonight. I'm like mm -hmm. racing ahead. Yeah. Do you find that, that that comes into your artwork as well? Do you, I know you don't rush stuff. But right, right. Um, I think I am a workaholic. Just like, just like you, you're hard on yourself. I'm... A perfectionist. Yes. So I, I'm constantly trying to perfect this. If this face doesn't look right, mm -hmm. it's getting started over. Right. That's it. And you know that's my fault. And Not the customer's fault or anything else. So so yeah, I'm always trying to say um, I'll never work weekends. You know, I'm gonna spend it with my friends, my family, and blah blah blah. Do you do that now? But you, that you put doesn't yourself happen. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. He knew. Right. He yeah. knew exactly what I was talking yeah. about. It never happens. Yeah, this doesn't. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's it's hard. It's, it's hard to shut off. Exactly. Creatives, the, our, our minds are going all the time. I'll, I'll find myself going to, go, going to bed at night, and all of a sudden it, I'd come up with an idea or concept that I, you know, oh, I hope I remember this shit tomorrow morning to do yeah, it or write yeah. it down at least. But it's, yeah. it's constantly racing. And then, you know, I think we all have children here, kids. Yeah. You know, that, that's the most important thing to me is, is family and uh, 
but it's hard. It's hard to balance to get the balance because it just seems like it's twenty four seven trying to make a living at mm-hmm. painting. Yeah. Do you, have, do you have sticky notes all over the place? Yeah. 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 Me too. Just little ideas. I everywhere. got a lot of pictures on my phone where if someone was to look through my phone, like, why are you taking a picture? You know, but it's that's how yeah. I remember things. Yeah. yeah. So I got so crazy. much shit, I got so much shit going on at once. It's my dad or my mom or my daughter, she goes, you know, well, your your art room is a mess. I said, This is an organized mess. So just yeah. leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, it's tough, man, because uh motorcycles ruin me because I enjoy riding them and I enjoy the life that I have on them so as much as I want to do some art I actually most of the times rather would not yeah. you know what I mean it, yeah. it sucks man well I'm just now coming out of that phase of where I looked at art as work you know what I mean and I have for so long because it's been work you know and so trying to back off of it and get more of a hold of it it's like I can start looking at it as art as fun as creative outlet again but and it, it is now, you know, with the type of work we're doing. But before, when I was married to five guys, you know, hey, how's my bike coming? And not looking at it, not even sanded yet or not yeah. even prepped. It's like, it's going good. I don't, I don't want to be, <laughs> I never want to be in that place because it's just a bad place. And it's bad organization and bad planning and, and not standing up for yourself and, and saying like, look, I'm sorry, man, I, I can't take your job. And being better about managing your money and things like that so you don't have to take jobs you can't do. Right. So there's... I found a happier place in my life by um, just realizing all those struggles of being an artist. And now that I'm starting to get rid of them and, and get a hold of my life, I enjoy doing the art again. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, now, I, you know, I'm, I'm a goal guy. Like, I need another goal. And I don't know what's net. There, I don't know if there's anything, another goal that's that's uh, in the paint industry that's... that's um, exciting to me you know like i love art and i want to do creative things but now that i've started to do so many other things my creative where i want to take my creative energy is like in a visual form through videos or these podcasts or something else and it kind of sucks because it's like i you know i listen to you guys like fuck man i want to do some more art too but it's it's just like not there for me the same way like i love what i do i'd like to do like work on my color portraits right i like to add some more different styles of doing i want to do smaller faces on there Mm and like more like scenes and stuff you know those kind of things but they're just small things that are really just for myself and my own like ego to know that yes i can still do a color portrait you know those kind of things but man like just the living and doing things and experiencing things and traveling like that shit has made my life way better you know what i mean oh yeah knowing people everywhere and having a reason to go see them again like that's 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 a good that's life yeah you have a life again i mean you 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 feel like when you're sitting in the garage for fucking weeks on end doing things you feel productive and it it really is cool it but to me it's a it's just another phase of that life game that you're playing and it's fun you gotta It, you know, it's almost like uh, when you go up to talk to this is how I feel when you go up to talk to somebody. I sometimes don't, oh, hi, my name's DJ. I don't because I'm not around people, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't get out, I'm always in the shop and I'm always painting. It's like mm-hmm. that's that's the probably the downside as far as you know, I miss social interaction, sh- yeah, social yeah. interaction of a shop where you have other dudes, but at the same time. I, I like working by myself too. You know, yeah, I just turn yeah. the radio and do my thing. But you know, I love I love what you're doing with the podcast, man. I, this this is really awesome that you're giving a, a artist a forum and mm-hmm. the biker community. And you know, it's yeah. Awesome. I mean, Thanks I've been telling him. Me. I've been thinking about like completely separating the motorcycle shit and the paint stuff. It's just Fuck yes. it's finding a way to to. It sucks to say, but it's finding a way to keep it interesting because most of us started doing this shit the same way. Just like yeah. every bike shop kind of started the same way. So the, hey, man, how'd you get in here? Oh, well, you know, I used to draw comic books and loved horror movies. And <laughs> you you kind of get that. It's a very common. Yeah, it's a common theme. Common theme. Yeah. You know, yeah. so um, finding a way to make it an inter- interesting, you know, format to do it is what I'm kind of looking at now. Because I do want to separate. I think that there's nothing there's nothing going on for us in this industry. Yeah. You know, no real voice. You know, like, I think some people still think the best thing to do is get a TV show in this industry. <laughs> you know, like, oh, yeah, you're going yeah. to be on top then, buddy. 
you know so it's you know fine i'd like to do it and i and i think that uh you know fucking painters are cool man especially like it's so much better to like be friends and know everybody and support them and put them out there than just trying to like you know think that i can paint everybody's bike i can't fu- there's no right. fucking way you know yeah. what i mean so you know i don't know i appreciate you liking it though i, I do appreciate that so I knew the second you told me that that you were going to do a podcast, I was like, yep, you were on to something. And it's so cool to see. Now, how long has it been? It has to have been, what, almost two years? Uh, two years in January. The funny thing okay. is me and Ryan talked about it mm-hmm. at SEMA in 2017. So yep. we talked about it, and he said he was going to do it. Okay. I had already had a bunch of people tell from the bike scene to tell me to do it. Right. So I remember I was it was over the Christmas break. I was with my wife in Oklahoma with her family, mm-hmm. and I'm just sitting there on Amazon looking at some microphones. I didn't know none of this shit, but my brother with his little you know his music stuff, he yeah. knew how to kind of do this a little bit. And that's when you called me, and I was like, dude, I'm in. Are yeah. you fucking kidding me? And that I jumped in on episode two. Mm-hmm. Where are you at now? Uh, you're in the 90, hundreds. 94, 95. Okay, like so that. you're yeah, you were close. Yeah. On there, wow, that's awesome, man. I mean, to even see it grow into what it is now and today, um, man, yeah, no, I'm proud of you. I, I know we all are, and it's something that I think the industry needed because I mean, we don't get exposure. And I think you and I talked about that. a lot of people mentioned this to me when I formed Paint Huffer. They were like, "Man, nobody was giving painters love, and nobody's giving us exposure, and you give us a platform and." It was hard because the big the big dogs out there only had a few select people, and maybe those people weren't even that good. Like my buddy down the street blows that guy away, but nobody knows about that guy. So it's awesome to think that yeah, you, you didn't know, see a lot of painters that would get kind of like made a little bit in the scene, yeah, and be like, hey man, you need to check out my, these guys. You know, it, it was never you know it was almost like because we're so not used to getting any kind of love, yeah, that you kind of like want to get it all for yourself, and you they would I mean? hoard it. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And I think some of those artists, I think it was something that we touched on a little bit earlier. Maybe it was the area that you grew up in. Maybe if, if you lived in Los Angeles, if you lived in New York, Chicago, any of the major metropolitan you know, big areas or whatever, it was that way. But as far as me being out here in Phoenix, I want to see this place grow. And I often post that. I'm always like posting arrows on an artist. I don't care what product you use. Fuck, I don't even care what flake you use. If you use somebody else's or whatever, I don't give a shit. All I care about, I mean, there's a thousand shoe companies, there's a thousand jean companies. Mm -hmm. Who cares? I don't care. I'm just glad to have a piece of the pie. To even be accepted into this industry is a hard thing. And to keep it sustaining is even harder. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, fuck, dude, I hardly get sleep. I work all the time. But I'm honored to be here. You know, and I'm honored to be in this industry. It's rad to think that we can make a living doing this. Yeah. Fuck, dude. I I mean, what I'm excited about talking to different painters and even different areas of the custom paint world is to is like when you know there's probably a ton of bike guys that might listen to this podcast and be like i don't know what the fuck they were talking about all day you know i think they'd still be into it though. but the guys that are in their garages that paint and listen to this stuff when we when they paint those guys i'm like fuck man like yeah yeah it all all the references are gonna go somewhere with them but um man like i think it's cool once you start hearing more of the stories about how and how like certain painters view things i might not be the most i might be a little more grim than some but when you hear like the view of you and you and you and poland and lucky strike and you know matt and these guys it's like it helps other painters like realize okay okay they go through it too Right. Yeah, They're I'm not. Really, I'm not yeah. going crazy yeah. in here. Right. Right. You they, know what I mean? They tie their shoes the same exact way. Yeah, and they had to go it, it humanizes same. people that totally. that that I know. I have put people on. I remember the first time I went to SEMA. Mm-hmm. I remember walking around in SEMA, and I I I kind of was so nervous to walk up to that Awada booth because Fonzie was painting and fucking Charles Armstrong was sitting there painting and all these badass people. I'm like, they're like, hey man, you want to get an airbrush and try it out? I'm like. For real, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like and it's the wall, like anybody can airbrush on it. You know what I mean. It's cool, but just seeing these guys for the first time in the flesh was like fuck, man. But all you, you didn't have any other way to know anything about these people. Like That's right. you had no idea of what kind of personality they had. It was the same know? thing as the rock stars in the eighties, and the seventies, and the sixties. There was no way to, when you saw somebody came into town, you learned that through 
a hard copy newspaper or, or a New Times or whatever, you never got to see who they were about. So they put them on a pedestal that was yeah. even higher. Right. Now, I think, I think if you do this podcast, I think you really should do that, a separate one. Mm-hmm. Maybe branch that into something with the painters on there. You are, because when you were first starting out, Chase, how did you, who did you question? Like, did you, did you, you learn from the Airbrush Action Magazine? Like, you went to some of those man, events, right? You gotta understand, like, in the 2000s, man, like, things were cutthroat, man. Like, you didn't right? have the opportunity. Like, I was fortunate because I worked at that shop. And this is why I'm asking. Yeah, and yeah. the guy that worked there, like, I was fortunate because I worked in certain shops and I was able to see certain artists. But right. I'm a visual learner. Like, I can watch you do something and I can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what helped me out. Mm-hmm. Now, it, even when I started painting helmets, there was nobody to teach me. There yeah. was no YouTube. Nobody yeah. showed me how to mix up, um, you know, an inner code or how to, how see, to, how to do stuff yeah. on there. The real I'm learning learning comes from trial and error. So when you yeah. try this shit, you'll find out, like, when you go to a class, right, the class is very informative. But if you haven't tried it enough to have the questions to figure out the answers, yep. you, these answers are going to be flying past your head. And you don't even know that they're the answers you're looking for. Right? I think that's something where you and I are going to structure a class. Yeah. We're going to definitely define a lot of those to help people beginners you know, and intermediates to help them do that i think that's something that, that we need to do and something that when they go to a class jason i talked about is that you're going to learn something you're going to walk away going holy shit i feel so much better i've got, my light bulb went off i can i feel confident yeah and i feel comfortable that i can contact these guys and, and ask further questions and come into it more because the same thing with the tattooing I had to go get tattooed from people that I admired in the industry and thank God they were able to tell me as they're working on me and telling me and you know it's yeah. like okay you know but those were sacrifices and those were things that I had to make and I was like yeah cool I want to get tatted by this guy he's a badass and if I can sit and talk to him for two hours while he's working on my sleeve I'm going to have that knowledge and that'll be, that'll be going forward yeah I mean there's a lot of old heads that were like Shut the door. Literally, like, I don't want you to see how to do this, and then you take my job. Like, that was a mentality that's been around for a long time, Fuck and still yeah. some people like that. I remember pinstripers back in the day, even when I was first learning, too, that were like, fuck you. Get the fuck out of here. You're going to learn it on your own. I'm not teaching you shit because you're going to take my clientele. Everybody was so worried about having a competition. Yeah. Somebody down the street. And I'm like, I don't have your hand. I don't. Get, you can hand me the same brush. You can hand me a guitar. I'm not Eddie Van Halen. Mm-hmm. I can play Eruption. I can play his stuff. I don't have his fingers. I'm not him. I think that a lot of people didn't understand the way it worked when you when it comes to learning things. It's like some people might pick up something and they might have more hand-eye coordination mm-hmm. and they might pull a couple lines straight, you know. But it's the same It's the same analogy like the first time you go play golf. You'll probably play pretty good Yeah. because you don't know how to fucking play. Right. And then when you start thinking about it, you start trying to figure out how to, how to play right. That's when... That's when your all, all your bad habits come out because you're trying. You've already you've got some learning going on. You're like, okay, what if I do this? Well, fuck, man. Yesterday when I just threw it on there and did it did it perfect. Now now oh, I'm fucking done. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's what happens, man. But that was the hardest part. But it also is what made it. Uh, you know, that's how I got here. You know, so I'm right. not. But right. like I said, the the one the one thing if if any class out there, if people are looking at taking classes. If you try this shit, you're going to have a question to ask and you're going to find an answer as opposed to like, hey, just just showing up and just hoping you teach Thanks me a lot. stuff. See you, see you, you next know? year. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's going to be the main thing for anybody to learn shit because, you know, if, if I went and shadowed him and watched him airbrush, mm-hmm. I want to master that that style of softness and, and that cartoon kind of look. But... I'd have to try it a couple times on my own right. to realize where I'm finding my roadblocks. Right. Yeah, I've seen Tim. I mean, I filmed him. I have sat there and watched him, and I watched his film over and over again. But there's no fucking way. I don't. Have it it might not even be the. It might not yeah. be the techniques. It might be the. You know, one mm-hmm. thing about pinstriping, right? You go stick a brush in in a brand new bottle or a brand new cup of fucking one shot, right? Right. Some of that shit's super thin out the can. Some of it's super thick, and you it have to on the know. color. You You're have right. to know how to how to like what consistency it has to feel like so true. to get the look you want. That's very well said. The pig, the pigmentation of it, the consistency of it. You're right. It's absolutely. Those are just tricks of the way. I mean, they, yeah. So you learn that. Do you think that you would have been a lot further if you would have started today? And I mean this today, uh, like as far as the YouTube's, the social media, 
all the I think, accessibilities. I think, it's, now. I think it's harder. It's easier, but it's harder. I saw a lot of people coming in the tattoo industry that would tattoo for maybe three weeks, and they are fucking mind blowing. Yeah. But they've also had everything handed to them to where they can easily learn everything in one week. Where it took us, me, at three in the morning, going, "Fuck, dude, how the fuck is this guy doing this or that?" Yeah. I think there's some something to be said for that, and it's cool to see. I want to see where they're going to be in another twenty years right. or whatever. But I'm like, motherfucker, dude, how cool is that? Yeah, you know. So, yeah, there's certain things about um, now that that would be. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more information mm-hmm. and stuff, but it's like kind of an information overload as well, too. Yeah, you know, the, yeah, you know, you can kind of get overwhelmed with like techniques. There's so many different styles and techniques now that. You know, either you're going to be receptive of all this information, or you're going to create one badass brainchild of all these ideas. <laughs> I think that's yeah. where Alex Gray kind of came into play. Or you're going to be fucked because you can't figure out which one to focus on. Right. I think you some know? people just have to get out and escape and do their own things. Coop, you talked about that, doing the devil faces. That's yeah. what he's known for. Alex Gray, of course. I mean, just doing this maniac, mind blowing, yeah. you know, algorithm type paintings. I think you know that he you know he was a uh, before he had an actual job doing anatomy paintings for for books makes sense he's doing signatures is what they call that six yeah, yeah when they do six really that was yeah. his job so he, he he was like a he was daily painting bone structures and, and respiratory things Dude, and fucking cardiovascular sense. like all this shit and then you know obviously then he does lots of drugs and then you get this fucking yeah. spirit realm of shit going on yeah. but he does drugs <laughs> That's the one thing that a lot of people, uh, I tell a lot of people that I talk to, I was like, every industry has art in it. Like there's an art job in every fucking industry, whether it's designing these tables, the floors. Accounting. Everything. There's some kind of art in it. And it takes, you know, like if you're trying to find a way to make money in art, then you maybe you just need to look for the things that you're good at that might not be what you would consider art and find the art in the industry and exploit it in some kind of way. I have a question for you. Hmm. I never thought that I was ever competitive, okay? Like, I never grew up going like, oh, I need to be better than this guy down the street, or I need to skate better this way. Like, I grew up skating and surfing was was a big thing. But the more and more I got out of this, the more I realized, like, my dad, he was really into sports, and he was the, um, like, the lineman. He would do all the, uh, the chain game for a football team at our high school. I didn't play high school football, but I surfed for the the surf team. Mm -hmm. But I grew up later on thinking that, wow, you know what? I was actually pretty competitive. And I think that's what pushed me to have ambition and to drive and all that. Do you find that, were you that way growing up? Were you competitive? Or do you think you were competitive with yourself later on? I was competitive with myself yeah. all the time, you know. Did you play sports or were you into um, art? Did you do art, art, art classes? Not so much sports, just art. It was just art. Yeah. I was a sophomore and they asked me to be into the AP, to the Advanced Placement Art. Yeah. And then I was going to go to Chicago, to the Chicago Institute of Art. So we're going to get you a scholarship on there. And I met a girl, and I got her pregnant. I was 17 at the time. And I was like, you know what? I'm out. i got to go become a father now. I'm going to go jump into the military. At the time, 17, you needed a parent permission to, to sign off for that. So that's how I went with that direction. But I was very – I didn't want art to become a job. You know what right. I mean? I wanted it more to be fun and to, to be loose in that yeah. way. But I guess just as I grew older, I was like, well, maybe I am. Because in the way of the business, still that way, I never really care about any other company. And we've had talks about this DJ a lot of time been there too. I think it's more if you just stay focused and keep your head down and, and go and like constantly think of what you're going to do next. It's a chess game. You, know, yeah. you constantly play that way. Yeah. So I, I often talk to people because everyone here is driven. We're all been, obviously have been that I, way for a long time. Did you you play I basketball? Make, yeah, I do. But when I whenever I made like my own enemies out of like I'm you're my enemy because I want to get like I'm in comp- competition with you, not verbally that you would ever know. Mm-hmm. But I'm like fuck, I want to do that. I want to be on that right. level. Yeah, yeah. So I would push myself and I would make that my goal and challenges. And that's kind of one of the things I've talked about a lot is that. As I've grown in this thing, I've ran out of places to turn into a new challenge. Gotcha. Not not because I'm so great. It's not that, but just some of the some of the challenges that are still on the table. They don't really they don't entice me. I guess is the word. Like mm-hmm. there's nothing about them that makes me go fuck yeah. I want that now. You know what I mean? Like it was a magazine, and then it was SEMA, and then it was you know, and then the magazines are gone, and then 
you know, it's, it's just always changed. And now it's at a point where it's like, now I just want to do film. it for fun again. But maybe <laughs> even good. film. Maybe we'll that's find good. that when yeah. we start doing this film or something like that. Another media, you yeah. know. I think that's something for myself as well. I think something that we can timestamp it and look back. How cool is this, though, to think, even if it was a shutdown today, that we were even a part of this industry, to have some recognition, right? somebody to say, Holy shit, dude, you did it. You did something that was yeah. worthwhile and that people liked on there. Like I said, I don't care if there could be a million different paint companies, but the fact that I have a slice on that pizza, fuck, dude, I'm honored. Yeah. You know, that's cool. I, I don't take that for granted whatsoever. And to think if I was to pass away today or tomorrow or whatever, somebody down 20 years ago or 20 years from now is going to be like, hey, paint offer, you remember that company? Just to have some recognition that way. Yeah. Do you think about that yourself as an artist? And yeah. How much, I mean, what you're going to leave your, for the your legacy? Time, I'm pretty sure you felt this way. You know, you just wanted to be recognized by your peers. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know I mean? And so, um, going to SEMA and going to the art classes and, and these people know who I am. It, it felt great. Yeah, it's very I, rewarding. It, I felt really honored for them to think of me as one of their own. If yeah. that makes sense. I agree. So. Acceptance is, is a huge That's one of the reasons comment. why I had such a hard time going to those things and mm -hmm. learning anything. Yeah. Because it kind of fucked with my head a little bit to where I felt like, man, like, you know, am I one of them? Right. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Right. It's kind of a weird place to be, but, you know, I said, it is. It's that thing when people tell you that you're an artist. I had a hard time with that. People are like, oh, you're an artist. I'm like, ah. Uh. Look, as an artist, as being like a finite artist or something like that, I appreciate that. I appreciate you saying that, but I'm not an artist. I don't know. I just, and that's me just, I don't know, being humble or just not, I'm not that type of showboat guy. It's why I'm not on Instagram every two seconds or whatever. I don't need, I don't need that. I will be, but I yeah, don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Like the compliments are great and stuff. You know, they, they obviously, I mean, that's, you got to think like somebody that doesn't know you, they don't really know what to say. Yeah. They don't know how to describe what they're seeing. Like if they like it, man, like you're talented, you're this. I mean, I can't be mad at them for saying that because what other word can describe that, that they're seeing, you know, we might not feel as though it's as a talented or as artistic as, as um, you know, what we consider to be art and talent, mm -hmm. you know, but it's just levels of perception of what, what people are getting. You know what I mean? It's just it's hard because, mm -hmm. like I like when people like shit on social media. Like, oh man, I love this. It's badass. Mm -hmm. That way, because I'm like on the shitter or something. Like I don't have to like look them in the eye and be like, oh thanks man. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. so <laughs> it's not confrontational. Hey, <laughs> what, right. so what's your name? <laughs> yeah, hey, how are you? Yeah, Where yeah. do you come from? It's not. It doesn't open a dialogue that you have to that you yeah. have to answer and then, to. Because it's almost like at that point you can kind of come off as. You know, at least through social media, you get to hide behind that curtain a little mm -hmm. bit and just, you know, put the artwork out there, let people appreciate it or not. Yeah. And then you don't have to put your personality on it, too. And you and, and I talked about that earlier, too, about being famous. Yeah. I dude. personally would never want to, I would want to be like the bass player in 311. Like we talked yeah. about, okay, they've been around a long time, they made their money, and, you know, that's fine. But I, I wouldn't want to be just hounded. I would like to I have I want the opportunities that fame brings. I don't really want to be. Like the f like, being super famous and super known does not like sound fun. It is cool. Like when I meet somebody famous, I'm not like, hey, sign my tits. You know what I mean? Like I don't. I I just can't. You're a human being. You're just like me. Yeah. We're on that level, and there I admire the fuck out of what you've done. It's amazing, and you definitely are are an amazing human being. But I don't fucking know you, and I know you for two seconds. It's cool. I'm honored. Like when I said, like I met Cartoon at an art show. That meant more to me than, you know, maybe meeting somebody who's like a Johnny Depp or something. Like I'd be like, okay, cool. I love your movies. I love what you do. But I don't know art. Well, I think a guy like Cartoon probably appreciates the fact that people I mean he's very famous and you know mm -hmm. people like he's probably a little bit more ground level appreciative towards fans mm -hmm. as opposed to someone like you know Johnny Depp who probably gets fucking bombarded oh, every dude. time he goes anywhere my little story with cartoon I met him at, a, at an art show mm -hmm. and he had his baby in his hand and she was crying like crazy and I went up to shake his hand I was like no 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 I'm not gonna do that fuck that let, let the guy put his daughter down yeah. to sleep so about 20 minutes goes by and I came back around after checking out the gallery and there he was, and he was like, hey, man, I appreciate that. He goes, do me a favor, 
hold that shirt up to your chest. And that's when he drew that whole mural on my chest. And you can't buy that. Like yeah. that was his appreciation for me. And I just thought that was so like endearing that he was like, you know what, thank you. And here's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to town on this and, and mm -hmm. give you something. That's this type of stuff that I love. Cool. Ooh, I think that's very cool. Well shit dudes, we're gonna wrap this up. Tim, tell everybody your social media and shit. Uh, it's uh, Tim underscore Lowry underscore arts. That's on Instagram. And, you got a uh, website too, right? Uh, yeah, it's uh, www.timlowryarts.com. And you? D period J A Y period arts, A R T S, I believe. DJ arts. It's like you're writing code over there. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably change it now. <laughs> And no again, th thanks again for no having problem, me on. Thank you. And, uh, I'm honored to see you with Tim and, and you as well. Yeah, thank you. Nice and everybody you. knows Paint Hover. Yeah. Oh, hey, yeah. thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Dude, you guys are amazing. We were able this to do this. A, it was I, a real honor being here. And, and when you asked me, I was like, oh, wow. Was like, yeah. Dude, th there's so many badass painters that I want to bring on. And it, really, I've been struggling with the idea of separating the podcast to be completely paint driven on one side and, and, uh, and motorcycle driven on the other because our audience is heavily in the motorcycle side and um you know i don't, I don't want this to be a bike conversation because you're you the art you do is is much more low rider and yeah. that's what i want to talk about so it, you kind of worry about it like when you have a show like oh well the audience is you know here for this but yeah. it's like yeah fuck it yeah you they don't want to hear this right <laughs> tim do you have a personal car are you working on a low rider for yourself or do you no, have, no. And people ask me that all the time. They're like, hey, do you have a lowrider? Do you have this right, or whatnot? Right. And I'm like, well, yeah, I have cars that I'm yeah. interested in flaking out. I, would, I would love to get a lowrider someday. Yeah. 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 I just didn't know. I mean, I know a lot of people maybe ask you that or they you know, they kind of assume. It's yeah. so funny how the public assumes that you have 20 lowriders in your garage and right, they're right. all like yeah. masterpieces Badass. and stuff, yeah. right? New all ladies bad. all over. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I'm excited to see your sculptures. Yeah. That's yeah. definitely going to be yeah, yeah. a great that's thing. Be a fun project. But that's just one of the yeah. thousand projects we we get we artists yeah. want to do, right? Right, right. It's cool, all guys. Time. I'm fucking sleepy. I've been up for a oh, long time. Oh, dude, I hear you. I, gotta I know work. you have. I got to go to work and I yeah. still gotta, we still got work tonight. I got to go to sleep. Yeah. 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 I appreciate you guys. All right, cool. Once again, I hope you guys enjoyed that. All you painters out there that listen to this podcast, I hope you found some some insight to just our perspectives, uh, Tim's perspectives, DJs, paint huffers, myself. Uh, really enjoyed sitting down with uh, very talented people that I look up to. So I also want to thank our sponsors, Simpson Motorcycle Helmets on Instagram and SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com, Dream Rides John on Instagram, TeamDreamRides.com, and Fast Life at checkout for 10% off. Kevin at Big Bear Choppers on Instagram and BigBearPerformance.com, 909-478-7788. Give him a phone call. Paint Huffer Metal Flake on Instagram, PaintHuffer.com, Fast Life at checkout, 10% off. At Lindahl Breaks on Instagram, LindahlBreaks.com, Fast Life at checkout, 10% off. And Lex and Moto on Instagram and LexandMotorcycle.com, 15% off with Fast Life at checkout. And you guys, thank you for checking this out. Give us a follow on Instagram, The Fast Life Garage, if you do not already. Also, go to our website, Fast Life Garage. And if you want to help support us and uh, help us bring on more of these badass guests and do more with this podcast, on the front page, it says become a patron. Uh, you can donate a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, one ninety five, one sixty five, fifty dollars a month, like our good boy Aaron Coint does. Anyways, I appreciate anything you guys could do for us to help us continue to do this podcast. And um, thank you. And uh, we'll see you again really soon. Peace.